This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. There you'll get uh, special savings as listeners of this podcast. That's asleep.com slash Lex. And now, here's my conversation with Brendan Eich. When did you first fall in love with programming? I didn't program a lot when I was in high school, but I had a friend who had a Commodore pet. And after we saw Star Wars, he said, hey, let's make a, a basic uh, program that does the Death Star Trench run. And it was just, you know, simple 2D graphics. And I didn't know what I was doing, so I just helped him out uh, on the math and stuff like that. I was a math and science kid. I was really into uh, the HP calculators of the early mid 70s. These were the RPN. They were really strongly built. And as Arik Goldfinger <laughs> said, of gold, divinely heavy. <laughs> There's probably some gold in them too, gold metallization. But they were awesome calculators and they had all the scientific functions. So I was really into that. Um, so I, I aimed toward physics. Um, I was a little late for the, I think, the, you know, the 20th century golden age. And I read a lot of science fiction, so I was like, yeah, it's on to hyperdrives and warp drives. And uh, physics was not going to get there quickly. And I started hacking on computers while I was studying physics as an undergraduate at Santa Clara University. And, um, you know, I, I dodged the Fortran bullet because I was in the science department instead of the engineering department where they still did Fortran card decks. I think they had an auto collator. But uh, we were using Pascal, and uh, I got one of the first portable C compilers. Considered old school, like structured programming from the 70s. Uh, Niklaus Wirt, the creator of Pascal, was a good writer and a good pedagogue, right? He always at ETH would do these courses where it's like build your own computer, mm -hmm. build your own compiler build your own operating system from scratch yeah okay. kind of and uh <laughs> i know some people who are grad students under him and said he was um he would torture the students with things like this custom email system that had 25 word limit <laughs> 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 and uh things like that i unfortunately dodged both the pascal and the fortran bullets mm. uh could you uh, maybe uh linger on the, the Pascal, like what kind of programming language was it? W what is it reminiscent of, of today? Because it sounds like it may have had uh, an impact on your own tra trajectory. Yeah, it, it was in the Algol family and Algol was, um, you know, the big uh, successful uh, language design and compiler project in the 60s. It had a successor called Algol 68, which was ambitious, but not as successful. But Pascal was kind of a wordy, procedures and functions language. It distinguished between functions which return a value and procedures which don't, which mm -hmm. just compute. Uh, and uh, you could say that whole Algol family went into ADA. Um, Pascal had a second life thanks to Borland with Turbo Pascal, mm -hmm. which was hugely successful. Uh, I think in large part due to Anders Helsberg, who then went to Microsoft and mm -hmm. did you know, C Sharp and done that yeah. with his team there and it's done really well doing TypeScript, type JavaScript. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, there's a, there's a lineage here, uh, but I was also interested in C and Unix by the time I was an undergrad because uh, people were bringing Unix up on all sorts of hardware. I had some friends who were doing their own wire wrap computers, 6820 maybe. Um, and I was wire wrapping for my engineering course, um, 6809 or something simpler, building a computer on a board. And I wanted to build a more ambitious one and port Unix to it, but I picked the wrong processor. I picked the National Semiconductor NS16032, which was this amazing, you know, CISC, com com uh, complex instruction set computer, and not the reduced instruction set computers that were just being uh, contemplated into the mid 80s. Um, and risk ultimately won out. Risk won in some ways. It it, it dissolved into that you have both now. You have these superscalar architectures where, like Intel has kept 
probably too much backward compatibility at the instruction level, but that's just a, there's a front end that parses that into these, you know, these wide internal instructions. So, you know, the, the very long instruction word research that um, was also interesting at the time kind of became the microarchitecture inside the backward compatible Intel. Uh, but I picked the National Semi. <laughs> And like I said, I did it because I saw, um, I was being sort of childlike and naive about physics. And I thought, uh, meanwhile, the Valley is, is go-go for computers, the Apple II, right? The, the PC, the Intel um, 8086, uh, 8088 based PC, the IBM, you know, gave Microsoft the, the future for mm -hmm. <laughs> in a somewhat fishy deal. So it was wide open in the computing space, but in physics, you... you... <laughs> He studied under Kip Thorne at Caltech. Wow. Uh, but he also didn't, he ended up in software. He didn't <laughs> a lot of physics. So, uh, uh, does it make you sad that uh, theoretical physics, even with string theory, hasn't really had any foundational breakthroughs in the latter part of the 20th century? And uh, Yeah. And in fact, I'd say the problem is theory over, over experiment. I would say, you know, we need more. Aristotle and less Plato. Um, you know, <laughs> mathematics is not all physical. There are lots yeah. of mathematics that cannot be realized as far as I know in, in this world. So to understand the world, you need to do experiments. You need to you know, not just dream up uh, inductive theories that could have lots of alternative theories competing with them with no way to decide between them except aesthetics, which is not a good guide in my opinion. I don't know if you uh, are friends with or have a relationship with Elon Musk. Where's the, in terms of like what you would love to see our society investing in building up, is it closer to Elon or is it closer to Feynman? And where they can become, uh, like I said, uh, one of a large family of alternate theories that could be as predictive, but nobody's doing the yeah. winnowing out. That's such an interesting tension in society. You, you see this in the, even the softer sciences, which have a deep love for like psychology. You see this in epidemiology now yeah. with the virus. Absolutely. It's this tension of, you know, how much of the world can we understand through just a beautifully fit model? And then at the same time, my main work is in machine learning, mm -hmm. where it's like, there is no provable thing usually. It's just, it's kind of you, it's all about just getting the right data set and getting tricks and so on. Mm -hmm. And if there's this tension, even in my own soul of like, I grew, I grew up on theoretical computer science. Like I loved uh, uh, approximation algorithms, like all of that, like, different complexity classes, just mm -hmm. those little puzzles. Uh, with sort of crypto analysis or asymptotic arguments about, you know, can, can we have a quantum resistant crypto algorithm, things like that, which may not be practical, right? If you, if you follow Mikhail Dyakonov or Gil Kalai, there, there are big questions about how, how quantum computing will scale up. Um, how practical it will be. Is that something that you think about quantum computing and not, the... not except for spare time. Like you said, I, I'm not using this kind of computer science in practice because almost everything now is, is engineering um, and finding ways to get um, computers to be more useful for people, which goes from, you know, design problems, which are really kind of an art. Like Knut said, anything you can't automate is an art. Yeah. Well, um, we can have, you know, machine learning compose music and it can imitate, you can train it and it can sound kind of decent, but maybe lacking that yeah. je ne sais quoi. But, you know, user interface still, I think, requires uh, human art. So speaking of things that uh, didn't follow a perfect theory and model, uh, JavaScript. <laughs> so there's two things. One, it had an impact on the world at a huge scale, obviously. Mm -hmm. And it's also still is one of probably the most popular programming language in the world. So can we go back to the origin story? Uh, can you tell the story of how JavaScript was created? Yeah, I was at Silicon Graphics after graduate school for seven years, and it got to be big and successful and divisionalized and political. And I thought, um, 
kind of boring. And a friend who'd been there went to uh, one of the last of the super companies, the super startups in, in the early 90s. There were several. I suppose General Magic was a little after that or around the same time. But MicroUnity was that company that I went to. And it was because my friend uh, Jeff Weinstein had gone there from Silicon Graphics. He recruited me. And MicroUnity was doing everything. So this was, this was like the ultimate sort of pretend grad school. It was doing a new fab new semiconductor wow. process. It was doing new um, analog and digital circuits on the same very large but not wafer scale chip. Um, originally, it was um, five centimeters on a side. It was, it was really hot too, so it needed a water cooler. Um, it was a Craig killer, and then they shrunk it and they tried to do a, a home sort of media processor that was essentially a barrel processor, but you could think of um, trying to do all the things that we now see in modern architectures uh, with short vector instructions and um, sort of wide instructions or multiple issue. Or which, uh, which, it was, which uh, level it, of the software? It was like C, we were writing in, in um, we were using GCC, we were writing C++ right. and C. Uh, somebody I, I worked with there, um, really, very smart guy hired from a sort of Wall Street um, hotshot programming consultancy, did his own hardware design as well as software. And we were working on how to make uh, not only short vector units, but general bit shufflers and permuters. So you could do things like, um, uh, you know, crypto algorithms efficiently, and you could do uh, demodulation of the cable, you know, complex uh quadrature amplitude modulated signal. Mm -hmm. So you were, you were basically taking uh, A to D converters, dumping things in buffers, and then doing the rest in software. All the framing and the Reed Solomon and Viterbi and all that error correction. So that was really great learning experience, but it was not gonna work. It was doing too many risky things at once, right? If you, as Jim Clark said to me, when I hopped to Netscape after three years at MicroUnity, he said, oh yeah, you do 10 things each, uh, one in 10 odds, it's gonna be one in 10 billion, right? <laughs> yeah. um, the multiplication principle. So, you know, Netscape was already a rocket and I passed the chance to go there in 1994. I knew the founders because I worked at SGI, with Clark's company. Could you pause for a second in sure. Netscape? Uh, when was the launch of this rocket? What, uh, 94. Um, 94 was the launch of Netscape? Yeah. And I went there in early 95 in April. <laughs> okay. But, oh, so you said you missed the launch. Well, I missed the the end, the first floor employment opportunity, but the IPO was was August 1995. So I was there for that. How obvious was it that Netscape was like world changing? Uh, what was the layout? Was Netscape one of the first big browsers? Yes. So when when I was at MicroUnity still in '93, we saw a browser called Mosaic, and up till then we'd used email and we'd used Usenet, the NNTP protocol. We'd used news readers. We used FTP, we used all these old internet protocols, all relying on the DNS and TCP IP and UDP for that matter. Um, when I was at Silicon Graphics, we brought up the whole stack, right? We had to you know, discover how, how to find the ethernet addresses on your network and then find IP addresses for them, ARP protocol, all that stuff. And it was great because nobody knew in the 80s what was gonna win, all the proprietary stacks like IBM, SNA, and DECnet, and all these other protocols were mm -hmm. saying, it's we're gonna do it, or it's gonna be heterogeneous future. And instead it was, you know, Berkeley Unix and the TCP IP stack that dated back to the ARPANET that won. And I think we knew it, we all knew it at, at SGI, but the salespeople didn't. And so they kept trying to get m multiple network stacks interoperating, but in the end uh, it won. And so it, that was the internet. And it was email and texty, and it was used mm -hmm. very texty. And then uh, Tim Berners-Lee did his thing, but I don't think I was paying attention. Three, because one of the things that Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina did at NCSA was they innovated on on the HTML early HTML standard. They, in particular, mm -hmm. Mark sent this email saying, "Hey, everybody, we think you should be able to put an image in a page." And you know when he sent that, Eric Bean had already written the code. And, you know, I talked to Tim Berners-Lee more recently, just a few years ago, and he was like, oh, we had another way of doing it. And I, you know, it didn't, it didn't work out because Mark shipped his in Mosaic. And this convinced me of several things. One, the internet meant there was a huge first mover advantage and being fast, getting on first mattered a lot. 
And so, you know, Richard Gabriel of scheme and poetry fame has written about this. The famous poetry. Essay. What's poetry? He, uh, well, he's a poet. Uh, oh, actual poet. poetry. Yeah, he's like poet. talking about some kind of stuff. No, no. I mean, he's the founder of Lucid, which is where Jamie Zawinski worked before Netscape. And Lucid was doing, you know, compilers and Lucid Emacs, which was a fork of Emacs. Mm -hmm. Famously, Jamie fighting against uh, Richard Stallman. Stallmax. Um, <laughs> and so Richard Gabriel, you know, very, very brainy computer guy, but also a poet. But he wrote a nice essay that gets abused all the time. In fact, Jamie's put a kind of warning in front of his version of it on his site, jwc.org, called Worse is Better. And this is about survival advantage of software in the network world, in my opinion. It's about Unix. It started out being framed as Unix and Lisp, good news, bad news, because all the Lisp people, the MIT people were like, yeah. oh, you know, this is the crown jewel, right, uh, scheme, this, yeah. this Fabergé egg or common list, this giant cathedral. Of course yes. we're going to win. This is civilization. <laughs> and those... Wow. So the, you, you're saying this is a fundamental, like, principle of the internet is moving fast wins. You could say in in almost any network system, like in biological evolution, you see successful allele sweep populations, and they don't always have, um, you know, they aren't free of flaws. They heterozygous advantage, right? You can get both parents uh, give you the the gene variant, and you get sickle cell anemia, right? But but if one of them does, you're more resistant to malaria, and so this isn't. Um, a beautiful process except at large scale and then you realize that because it moves fast and can adapt it it can win and people still struggle with this i i used to struggle with this because javascript was done in such a hurry and the force of web compatibility meant early mistakes couldn't be fixed mm -hmm. and even the standards process injected new mistakes as it will uh, but often standards bodies go back and make incompatible changes. You can't do that with the web. It's more like, again, like biology, you, you, you preserve what still works. You don't want to break ATP metabolism or whatever. So yeah. um, you have to kind of resign yourself to the reality of um, worse is better being enshrined in actual design points you might not like. Mm. Um, and that happened with JavaScript. And I'm way over it, but uh, it also, I think, was a huge advantage. That's why JavaScript has kind of swept a lot of programming domains. Um, people will say, oh, it's not because of merit. Well, you're right, but we also improved it over time in the standards body. I spent yeah. 20 years doing that. And uh, you don't get that choice. It, it's like, I'm not saying that that was the best language. I'm just saying that was the right time to do it. And I like to say the alternative was n not to do it. I could have told Netscape, I can't do this. It's too rushed. And it would have been Visual Basic Script. And it's, it <laughs> would have been bad. Uh, so that's, that's a good way to present the alternative. But so you're, it was a Netscape and you, were, you have written it in how many days and why was it only that many days? And what was the the goal and the underlying principles in your mind? At the time? So the whole, uh, I'm, I'm sort of describing worse is better in a frenetic way because it fit the the model of Netscape, when when um, it was known that Jim Clark and Mark Andreessen were founding Netscape, and they did the first release in 1994, that browser took over from Mosaic. In fact, that's why Mozilla is called that. It's the Mosaic killer. It's like the giant monster <laughs> that kills Mosaic. It's awesome. And um, <laughs> they knew they could, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that, uh, again, it's not like you're doing advanced scientific research that is changing the world. You're more like taking down a, a uh, the last iteration of the browser marked it, which had images and, you know, other affordances before you stopped working on it. And you're making Netscape the new thing that has images, plugins, which was the way to do video back in the day. It had something that's kind of died now for tiled windows called frames and frame sets. Mm -hmm. um, it had oh, yeah, 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 yeah. HTML tables. That was new. Eric Bina did tables in Netscape 1.1. So when I got there, they were heading toward IPO. Clark wanted to IPO early. I think his instinct was right. And that kicked off the whole dot-com era, right? There was a recession in the U.S. in 91. You can see old Law & Order reruns where they talk about the recession, how hard it's hitting New Yorkers. And after that, uh, Greenspan really goosed things at the Federal Reserve, and, and technology had been sort of fermenting in a way that came together with the Internet. And Netscape made it you know, possible to do pets.com, to do eBay, to get people to recognize a URL on a billboard and then type it in when they get home. And that was huge. Um, that that was so fast moving a rocket that 
uh, Mark and um, the engineering team there thought we we need to make this a programmable browser, not just a a document viewer, not just a video. It was framework. all HTML with images and tables, and also yeah. like you said, frames. And Early so there plugins. Was no, there's no dynamic element at all. Yeah, the most dynamism you get was from a plugin, which there were a few of them then. Flash didn't exist at that point. Uh, it was, I think, um, Java applets yet or no? Well, that's the thing. We did the deal with Sun. In fact, I was recruited to go do scheme in the browser. Remember Guy Steele and Gerald Sussman's beautiful Lisp variant. I was going to do it in the browser because my friends from SGI thought, hey, we like scheme, you like scheme. And I'm like, I hardly ever use scheme. It's not really used in industry except yeah. in sort of silos. Um, but I like it. Okay, I'll come do scheme in the browser. <laughs> I have a slide from my 2017 uh, talk where I have Bruce Willis crawling through the duct in Die Hard. He's like, <laughs> come out to the coast, have a lot of fun. Come on, do Scheme in the browser. Um, but when I got there, there was no Scheme in the browser because they'd started a deal with Sun Microsystems. And my best contact there was Bill Joy, who I admired as a Berkeley Unix founder and you know, Sun founder. Uh, and Bill got the idea of making the browser programmable too. And so the... Idea, main idea was to put the Java VM, which at that point was not really easy to embed, into Netscape, including the Netscape version on Windows that was still most popular, which was the 16-bit Windows 3.1, mm -hmm. which was going away. Microsoft was coming out with Windows 95, and everyone was afraid they were going to do you know, Internet Explorer, I guess, 2 at that point, 3 the next year. They already bought uh, or invested in somehow Spyglass, this other company that shot out from NCSA mm -hmm. at University of Illinois. Um, and in fact, Microsoft had tried to buy Netscape in late 94 before I got there. And I heard about this later. I heard they offered way too little money. And so, you know, Jim Barksdale and Jim Clark said, get out of here, <laughs> you know, pound sand. But then they realized, oh, this is going to hurt us because now they're going to copy us didn't happen right away. I'm not sure when Gates' internet tidal wave memo was written. That's the famous memo he wrote when Bill Gates realized that Microsoft was going down this old copy AOL path or copy CompuServe path, mm -hmm. a project called Blackbird, presumably after the SR-71, I don't know. But they were going to make a you know dial-up service with a custom content language stack and custom rendering. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the web. Um, and, you know, they could have content partners, uh, they have a lot of money, but it still wasn't to scale the web. It wasn't going to be compelling. And Gates realized this and he turned the company on a dime and they couldn't buy Netscape. Again, I'm not sure of the timing, so they decided to copy it. And once we realized that, everybody inside Netscape felt even more urgency and more of a frenetic mood. And so my chance to do Scheme disappeared when the Java deal started brewing. But there was still a chance to do a, a companion language to Java because Java was a compiled, is a compiled language. Mm -hmm. It's evolved and improved qu quite a lot since then too, but it was for sort of a serious advanced programmers that cost a certain salary or hourly rate. And <laughs> people observed, Bill, Bill Joy observed, and, and I, yeah. Mark Andreessen and I observed that in a mature stack like Microsoft, you really benefit from having a scripting language like Visual Basic. Mm -hmm which became Visual Basic Script in IE3, but didn't take on, didn't take over uh, and kill JavaScript, that you need two languages. One is for the component writers who are higher price and more expert, and the other is for uh, scripters, certified public accountants, uh, designers, graphic designers with some programming inclination, anybody, mm -hmm. amateurs, doesn't matter. There's a uh, much more demotic uh, approach there for programming the components together, gluing them together. Some people say duct tape language, which I don't really like. But we saw that Bill Joy and Mark Andreessen and I, we saw the need for a companion language. And the gleam in our eye was to call it JavaScript, though I didn't like it. That was marketing's plan. Mark called it Mocha, which I liked. And nice. Netscape Marketing, I think, didn't like that. So they said, oh, there's some trademark in some software somewhere that uses Mocha, so we can't use that. And they tried live script in August and that didn't last. And then finally we got the trademark license in December, 1995. But the work I did to prove that it could be done was important because I, I came in in April and even then Netscape was growing so fast that they couldn't find an open hiring requisition in the client team for me. So they hired me into the server team. 
<laughs> and I worked for a month on the server team on what became HTTP 1.1. So I was actually, I had done protocol work at Silicon Graphics with Greg Chesson, uh, former Bell Labs intern, grad student intern who knew all the Unix founders. And Greg was very interested in taking um, protocols to the next level with VLSI because uh, he thought that CPUs wouldn't wouldn't scale up. He, he was mistaken in that, unfortunately. Moore's law more than kept up, and you have you know gigabit Ethernet running with conventional processors. I came into Netscape to work on the server side for a month, but I was I was thinking the whole time, what should this language be like? Should it be easy to use? Might its syntax even be more like natural language, like um, hyper? Talk, which is Bill Atkinson's language in HyperCard, if you have ever used HyperCard on an early Mac. Uh, and I thought, uh, well, I'd like to do that, but my management is saying, make it look like Java, <laughs> which looks like C from a distance. What, yeah. what does that mean? Is it braces? We're talking about visually? Does yeah. it mean like uh, what, what management, do they understand what they don't? Think marketing about didn't know, but, but management did, like Rick Shell, the VP of engineering, knew. And we had a plan even that, that was, if you have this companion language, you're going to glue things together between Java and JavaScript. So you're going to have commerce in memory in the heap with data oh, types. So you're going to want some of the data types in Java to reflect in the JavaScript. You're going to want the primitive types that Java unfortunately separated from objects. So at least some of them number, du uh, double let's call it in Java's terms from the C term for double precision floating point. Um, or strings or booleans um, and objects. And so right away there was this constraint that looking like Java meant kind of the C curly brace syntax, but also some of the data types and objects. Like objects and so on, yeah, all and that kind dot, of stuff. Dotted calls, Comparison operator, all Garbage that kind collection, of, yeah, all that garbage stuff. Collection, yeah. Yeah. Uh, even the bitwise operators and the shift operators, including the unsigned right shift, which Java had because it didn't have unsigned integer types. It's, it said, if you want to do unsigned operations, use an operator. And that turned out to be important much later. I'll, I'll tell that story if I have time. But um, JavaScript inherited a set of uh, operators, the expression grammar, the statement grammar up to a point from Java. But I wanted a functional language. I wanted scheme, a little bit of scheme, even though it wasn't as clean as scheme. I so wanted... you had a love, sorry to interrupt, you had a love for scheme and Lisp, that that that, that functional language landscape. Yes, I wanted first class functions because I, I saw the need for callbacks in the browser where it's a single threaded program. Wow. All the early browsers were single threaded and it's the right model for users. Most users weren't ready for mutual exclusion and yeah. threading. So in a single threaded world, you, you cannot block the user interface. So you have to use a callback and run later. And the without getting too fancy and trying to capture the continuation like call CC does in scheme, I thought I'll just make it easy to have fun arcs, first class functions you pass, you know, downward and they can call back, be called back. Um, and Java didn't have that at the time. It, it had, it took forever to get proper first class functions, uh, Lambda is now into, into Java, Java seven or eight, I think. It did have concurrency, right, from yes. from, the, from the very beginning. But you you were thinking that the a JavaScript in the browser would not have the luxury of being concurrent. That's right. And the reason was Java was going to run into plugins, so it could fork threads and go go to town. But the main action in the browser was in the single threaded program, the single Unix process on on Unix or Windows, uh, and it was where you had to service the event loop and then go you know do things respond to the network, lay out some HTML, render it, turn, you know, widths into heights by filling containers, boxes, uh, the early, what became the CSS box model, uh, and run scripts to, you know, make the thing livelier, respond to user input. Uh, and all that event-driven programming was in part like HyperCard because HyperCard had this on event name syntax. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you have in JavaScript on click run mm -hmm. together as the name of the event handler. Um, and there's some funny ones on mouse over and on mouse out. People <laughs> still complain about those. But you know, um, there are many more events now over the years standardized, but it was a mix of event-driven single-threaded programming because it had to run in the main thread of the browser where the action is. And Java never got there, which meant Java could not interact easily or quickly or n in a nested way with the document with the objects reflected from the HTML document with the tables and forms and so on. And 
that that is one of the reasons I think JavaScript survived and Java kind of died. Java was in this plugin prison. It essentially mm -hmm. was confined to a rectangle, the applet rectangle. And while we we even built uh, next year, uh, Nick Thompson, a friend from SGI, who was an intern grad student at CMU at the time, built the first version of Live Connect to glue Java and JavaScript together mm -hmm. to deliver on that vision where you do have commerce between the, the data types in the heap. Um, did it work? It worked, but you, you were Java was in charge. Uh, JavaScript was in charge, and Java was just these components, these helper uh, so objects. You might as well do everything in JavaScript. And what happened over time, it's like an evolutionary filter. It just kind of, who needs the plugin? And in fact, Sun mismanaged Java as a plugin. They, they thought, oh, Netscape is giving us the distribution vehicle, and we don't care about the browser. It's just about getting Java out there. And that was a big miscalculation. They then tried because Microsoft's killing Netscape after a few years, <laughs> they tried getting into Microsoft. And you may remember there was a Sun Microsoft deal, which famously blew up. And, oh. and uh, Microsoft kicked Java out of Windows. And that's when they really pulled the trigger. I think they already evaluated it and liked it on Anders Helsberg's .NET and you know, C Sharp and decided we're gonna just not have Java. We're, we don't want you know any of that Sun stuff. We don't want the patent risk. We don't want... I'm not sure what the fights were about. There was some patent angle to it, I think. And up till then, Microsoft had been using Java components, like in Outlook Web Access, which had a lot of JavaScript to be a webmail-like, hotmail-like user interface. Mm -hmm. They had to call the the mail server through uh, HTTP, and they, they used a, a, a Java object to do this. Mm -hmm. And when they gave the boot to Sun, they suddenly other, you know, the left hand gave the boot and the right hand said, we better do something else in Outlook Web Access. What are we going to do? And they said, let's just add an ActiveX component, which is their own na native way of embedding things in languages. And we'll make it, uh, it'll be what became. It could have bought, but fortunately didn't. The early Fortunately, didn't yeah, that we, uh, we would have screwed it up. I mean, what it, year were we talking about with Flash? I what, think what? after the IPO, so it was probably late '95, and the, oh, Flash was around. Was it Adobe? No, it wasn't. No, it was. It was, it was called Future Splash, and it was uh, these brothers, Jonathan Gay, I think his name was. And he he uh, came knocking, and the, the marketing guy at Netscape who was screening the technology partners or wannabe acquisitions was brutal, and just everybody wanted to get in on the Netscape, you know, stock gravy train, and he sent them packing. And they they ended up selling to Macromedia, and Macromedia was where Flash was created. And the good thing about Macromedia was it was a um, timeline uh, animation has sort of been immutable function uh, over time. They, they had the tooling around that too, like that Dreamweaver. There's a Flash Flash did, director. There were a bunch of them. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they, they, that was a Flash great. Builder was one of the last ones. The, these tools were used by real artists and, you know, special effects people and designers. All the restaurant websites around 2005 were done in Flash, which was, you know, we were trying to do HTML5 at the same time. That was the Firefox era. We were trying to make the web capable enough. You didn't need Flash. But if you recall, you go to a restaurant, it's like, this is kind of like a game or something. It's like a flash. Yeah. All the font looks small. And so you didn't like Flash from the beginning. You're like, this is this doesn't feel right. Not, not really. I, I actually admire Flash's technology, and I'm I'm pretty pragmatic about these things. And I I realized that <laughs> browser due to Microsoft's monopoly abuse for which they were convicted, and you know um, even after that, until I think Firefox and then Chrome was people kept saying, oh, the web can't do X, can't do Y. Yeah. We'll have to have a plug-in. We'll have to have a new approach. We'll, have, we'll, we'll clean the slate and have a new web. And everyone who said that failed. And the reason they failed is because there's too much value in the web, this huge network. And the worse is better principle means that you can not only start bad, which they all sneer at, but get on first and get wide distribution, get sort of an evolutionary advantage in the priority of play. the iPhone that was probably the death now put your energy into JavaScript and that happened right so we, we did things at Mozilla with Adobe to improve which bought my 
Macromedia to improve Flash and to improve the version of JavaScript that was in Flash. We tried to standardize that. Oh, that's right. I'm getting you ahead of myself. But it was ES4. Yeah. That's, that's right. That's right. Can, can we just rewind yeah, to sure. the magical, like, you know, the, <laughs> it's a special moment in the history of all of computing. It's, uh, we'll talk about it later, but it's arguable. It's possible that the entirety of the world will run on JavaScript at some point. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, it, it's like those are those days. It would be it would be interesting if you could just describe, actually zooming in on the how the cake was baked uh, from the you know the, the the several days that you were working on it. What was in your mind? Uh, how much coffee were you drinking? Yeah. Were you nervous? Why you're freaking out? I'll try to remember it. I mean, you're right. There are these pregnant moments you see in hindsight. Maybe they're overrated, but like Hegel sees Napoleon on horseback at, right. at Jena and says, yeah. "There's the world spirit uh, on on horse." Um, and uh, I knew that there was a chance to do it. Mark knew, and he was my, you know, executive sponsor and. He was the one, you know, sort of brainstorming how the JavaScript should be right there in the page. That was important for him to say that because I, I thought so too. But a lot of people were like, "Well, oh, you can't write programming language in the middle of the markup." Mm -hmm. And indeed, there are problems. If you did it naively, you'd see the code laid out as uh -huh. like random gibberish. So I had to figure out how to hide that. And that was a challenge. Is that is that a breakthrough idea? I mean, so you and Mark th thinking about this idea that you just inject code. In the middle of the market of the web page, yeah, it was considered kind of heretical. There was an SGML guru, I forget his name, but he corresponded with me. And at first, he was angry. He's like, <laughs> you, "You should have used a marked section. Why didn't you use a marked section?" And I said, yeah. "Well, SGML marked sections are not part of HTML, by the way, and they're not supported in the browser." Yeah. And so I, I did some hack that was equivalent. And over time, you could do the proper SGML thing, but eventually he came around and it, it was again sort of of evolutionary necessity it was almost like introgression like like you know the the idea um which uh, Lynn Margulies I think helped get across that uh we have to consider mutualism in biology that maybe you know mitochondria were ancient uh prokaryotes that got into the cell and became yeah. beneficial yeah. um somehow uh the, the same sort of thinking applies. Uh, you have to embed JavaScript in HTML. It, it's going to be a good virus. <laughs> it won't so hurt the you. So co uh, the code becomes data in a sense. It just gets carried, uh, it gets car carried. Ca ca carried along. But yeah. is there is there s the side of the... So you were focusing on Netscape at that time. Doesn't the browser have to support, interpret? Where those... HTML comment delimiters, instead of being multi-line brackets, became one line, or essentially one line. So you wrote, so JavaScript was written, the programming language was written as a comment. A comment for old browsers and a, a set of uh, brackets that were ignored with real code for new. And it was this two-way comment hiding hack, as I called it, that was absolutely necessary for us to get off the ground. We couldn't have bootstrapped JavaScript without it. We didn't have scripts that were loaded from a separate file. The only scripts in Netscape 2 were inline in the document. What were the challenges here? What, what, like, what, uh, you know, typing? Uh, uh, what were the choices you were thinking about? Garbage the collection. Design, garbage collection. I didn't have time to write a garbage collector, so I just I didn't at first. So the thing was using essentially arenas or what GNU calls obj pools, and just would run out of memory eventually. And I added reference counting in a hurry after the ten days in which I hacked. So after I was in the server team doing HTTP one one and thinking about the language. I finally got transferred to the client team in early May. And that's when I, you know, I got the go sign from Mark and it was like, we, we can't wait because people inside Netscape are doubting. Even people uh, inside Sun are definitely doubting. Bill Joy was the champion, but he was like alone in that, in seeing there was a role for JavaScript as the, the as I call it, the sidekick language, the Robin the boy hostage. <laughs> Frank, <laughs> Frank Miller put it in the Dark Knight Returns. Um, that uh, there was this silly little language that would be the glue language, and it could become important over time. And and you were better off having that complementarity, that pairing of languages, just like Microsoft Stack did with Visual C++ and Visual Basic. So what was the big moment of uh, I'm done? So I had to do a demo. I, I, I forget the dates. I, I think I, for a history of programming languages paper that Alan Wurst Brock did with my help, he did a lot of the writing. Um, I think it was the 10 days from like 
Thursday evening through to the following weeks, uh, you know, all, the whole of that week and then into the Monday. Did you get sleep? Not, not, not enough. And I was really uh, going fast because I'd already used a lot of um, C compiler and front end compiler knowledge that I'd gained from undergraduate school. When I started getting into computing uh, as a... <laughs> really uh l a l r one was the big thing, and I studied all this and learned how to parse them and in the end uh if you're doing c languages, you often do what um what what uh Dennis Ritchie did anyway, which is a recursive descent uh parser you can hand code it and um I did that for JavaScript in a blazing hurry, mostly got it right uh didn't you know have precedence inversion problems or other bugs, but I copied a lot from Java and c and I tried to keep things simple, like the equality operator in the, those 10 days. Database field that had been stringized. And they said, oh, can't we just have implicit conversion? And like an idiot, I agreed. I gave them what they wanted. I, I was trying to please them and get adoption. And that, you know, broke what, what equivalence relation um, nature there was to the double equal, you know, there's some edge cases with not a number that break that too, but yeah. it really broke it. Um, having implicit conversions in that operator is something that people still roast me over. So let's, let's talk about two things. One, it sounds like the comparison operator, the equality operator is the thing that you regret. So maybe can Make, you- Making it sloppy. Yeah. Making it sloppy. So what is the biggest thing you regret in those 10 days? And what is the biggest thing you're proud of? So that, that making it sloppy came after the 10 days. And my lesson there, which I've tweeted is, when people come to you saying, can you please make it sloppy or add this cute feature? The answer should be no. And I should have known that because I think Niklas Viert, one of my heroes said, the essence of design is leaving things out. Um, but during the 10 days, I also, like I said, I was in such a hurry, I left out garbage collection came back to haunt me, but I got reference counting in in time that people uh, weren't running out of memory right away on, on long-lived JavaScript. Wait, what happens when you don't have garbage collection and you have objects? Well, you just run out of memory. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I love it. It, it, at first it, you write a short script and the page doesn't last long or it doesn't do a lot and it's okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. But if you're writing a game or something and you're doing event-based allocation, you run out of memory. And this was noticed in the summer of 1995, and people were like, "What's going on?" I was, "Oh yeah, I gotta get, I gotta better go back and do reference counting." And then the ref problem with reference counting is you're writing the language in the runtime in C, an unsafe language, and if you're reference counting and you overflow the counter, you mismanage it so it goes high, it gets stuck high, you leak memory again, and you run out. If you underflow it, you pre memory that's still in use, mm -hmm. and even then we knew what all the the Security hackers came to know that you therefore have a potentially a remote code execution vulnerability because this was before things like um, non-executable um, heap memory and um, stack defenses against taking over memory. So if you can, from the the remote side, write some HTML and JavaScript that just happens to exploit a bug in memory safety, like it causes JavaScript to underflow a reference counter. And the script still has its hands on that object and it's trying to call a method on it and there's some kind of lookup function table in the object. But you've managed to stuff the heap with strings that forge their own lookalike for the function table. You can call some other code. And this was a problem right away. So security, you know, JavaScript up the ante. Java had this problem too, but in its own VM. And it Scheme made it in somehow uh, in, in at the spirit, end of the day. In spirit. Yeah. I mean, people complain because Scheme has, you know, minimalism. It has, you know, six or seven special forms. It has hygienic macros. It has call CC. It has sort of a beautiful, uh, complete um, set of forms to make the Lambda calculus pleasant to use in, in practice. Um, and JavaScript is, you know, kind of a multi paradigm or. Shambolic. <laughs> Just in a small tangent, you mentioned Mark Andreessen. It sounds like, and Bill Joy, but staying on Mark, it sounds like he had an impact on you 
in that he sort of believed in what you were doing there. Mm -hmm. Can you can you talk about like what role Mark had in your life? Yeah, we we would meet at the um, the Peninsula Creamery in downtown Palo Alto, and Mark was just fresh out of you know grad school or whatever he was doing, and he was a big dude, and he, he got fitter later. Uh, he had hair. He he would order giant milkshakes and burgers, and we would meet there and brainstorm about what to do. And it was very direct because we didn't have much time. The the sort of we didn't talk about it, but the implication was Microsoft's coming after us. Mark was saying things boldly uh, pre IPO like Netscape plus Java kills Windows. Right, this wow. was it's ambitious. Make, make a browser programmable; it becomes the new runtime for programs. Wow. You don't, it's the meta OS or it's the replacement OS. Um, but he still saw value in JavaScript. Yes. Be even though he was saying that and Java was the big name, hence the trademark license, uh, he saw JavaScript as important. And he even thought, what if we got, I told this in other interviews, I can say it. He thought, what if we had uh, my friend Kip Hickman, who'd been at Netscape from the beginning and who was a kernel hacker at S <laughs> Off had written very nice code, it was all written in Java, it was self hosted or mm -hmm. so called bootstrapped. And so we could use that as soon as Kip's Java VM could run the bytecode from the, the Sun uh, JVM running the, the self hosted compiler to emit the bytecode. So once we could bootstrap into Kip's VM, we wouldn't need Sun. And Mark was like, well, maybe we can just you know ditch Sun of we'll Kip's Java VM or we'll your JavaScript VM. We, well, now we need graphics. So Mark was thinking far ahead because he knew you could do things with HTML and images, but at some point you really want like this. dynamic graphics or yeah, like three dimensional. Like, like even SGI had already started its downfall because the first floor VLSI team there had gone off to do 3DFX and all these other companies that made the graphics card on your PC. Right, mm -hmm. Doom was was big and Quake, and so you were. We were all playing Quake. I was old, so I was terrible. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> lineage of graphics libraries or really graphics languages for the, what became the GPU. And Mark was thinking ahead. It's like, we need graphics too. And I thought, okay, I can try to get somebody I knew at SGI, but he's a grad student at MIT. He was studying under Barbara Liskoff. He laughed when he heard about this later. Andrew Myers, he's at Cornell, long time. I think he's a full professor. And Mark said, great, we'll get him. And I'm not sure he's going to come. We'll throw money, you know, we'll stock options. We never did it, and they did the Sun deal, so Kip nobly put aside his own JVM, and we used the Sun JVM. So that was an ambitious period, and Mark was very generative because he was pushing hard, he was ambitious, and he wanted to have Netscape possibly be in control of the ball. Maybe you can speak to the this dance of uh, Netscape versus Internet Explorer. Mm. You've... Uh, You've uh, thro thrown some loving words towards Microsoft throughout this conversation, but that's a theme with, uh, I mean, Steve Jobs had a similar sort of commentary. From a big sort of philosophical principle perspective, can you comment on like the approach that Microsoft has taken with Internet Explorer from IE1 to Edge today? Is there something that you see as valuable that they're doing in the in the occasional copying and that this kind of stuff or is it um is the world worse off because internet explorer exists so I, i'm going to segment this into historical eras because i think microsoft of today with satya is quite a different company and what they're yes. doing with edge is different but back then um gates you know aggressive character not really original in my view uh, not an originator Steve Jobs famously said once, he doesn't have any taste. And I don't mean this in a small way. He has no taste. <laughs> uh, you can see this. Right? Oh, we, Apple at the time had, had beautiful typography and you know, ligatures and kerning and the fonts looked great. Yep. And Windows had this sort of ugly system font that was carefully aligned with pixels so it didn't get anti why, what, what is it? I'm sorry to keep interrupting, but why, did, why was Internet Explorer winning throughout the history of these competitions? Distribution. Distribution matters more uh, than anything. And this is why, um, you know, even now we're seeing in the browser wars Edge doing better because it's being foisted on people of Windows. We have Windows 10 boxes at home. We have some Windows 7 boxes we or laptops we keep running to because we we don't connect them to the internet generally. But um, <laughs> but but uh, once you have that operating system f to hold, yeah. you, can, you can force, you know, Edge. And, and yes. Apple did it with Safari too. It's not unique to Microsoft. 
That's sad. But in a way. Uh, this condition matters, and that's why uh, I think IE was going to win, and that's why everybody at Netscape felt we're doomed. This was something Michael Toy and Jamie would say, we're doomed. Um, but for a while there, we had a chance, and we innovated in Netscape too. We did a big platform push, Java and JavaScript and... Uh, <laughs> stack out of what were pretty static web languages. And mm -hmm. even in the beta releases in Netscape 2, people were using JavaScript to build what you would call single page applications like Gmail. Mm -hmm. And they were using JavaScript locally to compute things and to call the server on a hidden frame in the background. So it was prefiguring a lot of what came later as Ajax or dynamic JavaScript, dynamic HTML. So people saw... <laughs> innovative that you would have code run in the browser it, it did impress me with something um which i learned later about from eric von hippel of mit which is user innovation networks lead user effects mm -hmm. that throwing out javascript even though we weren't doing open source we were doing beta releases early and permissively with netscape getting early developer feedback absolutely critical i loved it i did some of that with sgi with some of the products i worked on but it really came to the fore in netscape and that you know culminated in mozilla where you're dealing with developers all the time and early adopters lead users but the lead users helped improve javascript even in those last few betas where i could hardly change things i was under pretty rigid change control so we're talking about just a small collection of individuals that yes. are just like up front a guy named bill dorch you can find his work in the web archive still from 1996 it's a single page application it's an artist gallery of mountain art uh he's it javascript it doesn't quite work he uses javascript locally he uses a local database what you would yeah. think of now as json but it's all pure javascript code a bunch of objects being constructed that's so cool yeah. <laughs> so how is uh if you can do sort of a big sweeping progress of javascript how has javascript changed over the years in your view from those early 10 days with a quick add addition of garbage collection and fixes around security how has this evolution that now it's taken over the world in this, it's been a bumpy ride because the standards body got shut down after Microsoft, I think, um, took over the web and then felt punished by the US v. Microsoft antitrust case. Can you speak to the standard body? Like <laughs> That was a fun ride, too, because Netscape had uh, taken the lead with the web and HTML innovations like um, frames and frame sets, tables. And the W3C was sort of off even then, sort of in SGML land heading toward XML La La Land. <laughs> I'm going to be a little harsh on it. What's it, HTML? I'm sorry. HTML was the the precursor markup language to HTML. It was sort of the more extensible um, so standard generalized X markup language. It was it was a XML like pointy like, brackets, uh, but it had yeah. all sorts of elaborate syntax for doing uh, different semantics. And this is why I think uh, you know TBL and others who wanted to do the semantic web then took XML um, forward. But they had this. Uh, or some of them anyway, had this strange idea they could replace the web with XML or that they would upgrade the web to be XML. And it couldn't be done. Uh, worse is better had concrete meaning. The web was very forgiving of HTML, including sort of minor syntax errors that could be error corrected. Like error correction isn't generally done in programming languages because- right. That's it, another amazing thing about HTML is like, it's more like biology than programming. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and so uh, XML was in its standard form, super strict and could never have admitted, you know, the kind of users who were. Media type, put it through the HTML error corrector. <laughs> oh, wow. So they kind of bastardized it to make it popular and usable and accessible. And so XML as a pure, um, you know, thing was never going to take over. Um, and the W3C was kind of not fully functional because Netscape wasn't co cooperating with them. We thought about where to take JavaScript and we realized our standards guru, Carl Cargill, realized there was a European standards body that had already given Microsoft fits by standardizing parts of the Windows 3.1 API, which European governments insisted on. They said, Microsoft, we can't use your operating system without some standards. And Microsoft said, you know, here's our docs. And and the government said, no, we need a European standard. So this body called the European Computer Manufacturers Association, ECMA, which eventually became global and became a proper noun instead of an acronym. Right. It's uh it's just one capital E now yeah. with a lowercase CMA. Right. 
And as uh, one of the early Microsoft guys I met when we first convened uh, a working group to talk about JavaScript said, it sounds like a skin disease. <laughs> <laughs> but it gave, uh, I mean, maybe you'll speak to that, but it gave the name to JavaScript of ECMAScript. That was the standard name because Java was a trademark of Suns. They were so aggressive, they were sending cease and desist letters to oh, okay. people whose you know, middle European heritage meant their, their surname was Javanko, and they called their website javanko.com, and Sunwood sent them a letter saying, you're using J-A-V-A at the start of your domain name, you must cease and desist. <laughs> I love marketing more than anything else in this world. Uh, so so ECMAScript, and now it was popularly named as ES plus version. I would say people use JS more than anything. People still say JavaScript. JavaScript oh, is right, in all right. the books. So I mean, when you're referring to, it's usually JavaScript. And when you want to refer to a version of JavaScript, you'll say ES6, ES5. Yes. Or now they've gone to years, which is kind of confusing because it's an offset of 2009. ES6 is ES. Mm -hmm. On the first draft of the spec, uh, Sean Katzenberger, he's left Microsoft. He even did what I sort of did. He told his bosses, I, stop bugging me to do other things. I'm focused on this. Because it took a lot of focused work to create the first draft of the spec. And I was still holding, I was spinning almost all the plates. I had like part-time help in certain areas. And on the front end integrations, I had the front end guys. But I, I couldn't take as much time as Sean was to write the draft spec. But I had to participate because... I was essentially helping write down what the language did and in areas where we didn't like what it did and Microsoft didn't agree, we sometimes you know, got away with slight changes. And that's the story of standards. You, you have different implementations and depending on their market power, they interoperate where you have agreement and where they don't, the dominant one usually sets the de facto standard. Hmm. And then you should probably reflect that into the de jure standard. And this happened with JavaScript. Uh, over time, as Netscape went down and Microsoft went up, we did the first edition of the standard um, codified in 1997 in France. We had a trip to Nice, uh, which was very memorable. For any interesting reason or just because it's Nice? And, and ECMA is European and IBM and others were, you know, there. Uh, Mike Kalashaw, an IBM fellow, was a Britisher. And we, the, the, the guy who ran ECMA at the time, Jan van den Belt, was quite a... Uh, a raconteur and a, a very fun guy. And he had us out for, you know, the great, you know, Fui de Mer, the Bouillabaisse. And the... Was the standardization process beautiful or painful that uh, those early days, you as the designer of the language? It was painful because it was rushed. Now, Guy Steele was contributed by Sun. So even more than Sean, you had... So we had some really good people. And we didn't fight too much. There was some tension where I was fixing bugs and I was late to a meeting and Sean Katzenberger of Microsoft was actually mad. Like, where is he? We need him. And when I got there, I saw that only he saw this sort of off by one bug in somewhere in the spec. And then I saw it too. And I said, there's a fence post bug there. And then we kind of locked eyes and we realized we were on the same page and we kind of, he wasn't mad anymore. What, what were the features that are being like struggled over and debated and thought about and it was mainly yeah. writing down what worked and what we we thought should work in the edge cases that didn't interoperate or that seemed wrong. Uh, but we were already laying the groundwork for the future editions that I was already implementing. I was still trying to lead the standard by using the dominant market power mm -hmm. to write the code that actually shipped. Mm -hmm. So the de facto standard nice. would lead the de jure standard. And I was putting in the the missing you know function forms that I didn't have time for in the 10 days. So this uh, is the engineering mindset versus the theoretician. So you didn't want to create the perfect language, but one that was the popular and yeah. chipped and all that kind and of stuff. And you could say there was, I was standing on the shoulders of giants. So there was a staged process where I had to hold back things that it were well designed by others in other languages and I could imitate, but I couldn't do them all in the 10 days. So they came in in 1996 and 97 and they came into the third edition of the standard, which was final, finalized in 1999. But at that point, Netscape had been sold to AOL and was, which was a decent exit considering, and uh, you know had previously been uh, mercilessly crushed. But Netscape was selling the browser along with server software that it had acquired after its IPO, and Microsoft was just underpricing it. So there was no way to compete with that. Microsoft was also you know, it, making Internet Explorer the default browser in Windows, yeah. which is called tying in antitrust law. 
And they were doing even more brutal things. There's a famous uh, investor. He did very well on Google. So he's a billionaire, Ram Sri Ram. And he was sales guy at, or head of sales at, at Netscape. And he got off the phone looking ashen faced after Compaq called and said, uh, Microsoft just told us they're going to pull our Windows license if we ship. Around with advanced versions, JavaScript 2. I uh, had given the keys to the kingdom to another MIT grad, Baltimore Horwat. Hmm. Very big brain, still at Google, I think. He won the Putnam in 86. So he's, wow. yeah, very mathematical. Legit. Um, yeah. He, he, he designed this successor language, JavaScript 2, but it, it only showed up in mutated form in Microsoft's ASP.NET server side, and it what? didn't last there. And it showed up in Flash, and that's what became ActionScript three. Ah, which changed. ActionScript, yeah. interesting. And then, and then Flash, of course, declined. And so, how did we arrive at ES six, where it's it's like there's so many, where everyone, okay, there's this history of JavaScript that people were, it was just like cool when you're like having beers to talk crap about JavaScript. <laughs> Everyone loves to hate, like people who are married say, ah, marriage sucks, is they just want to get, let, let off some steam, even though everyone uses the language. Yeah. But ES6, everyone, it's become this like, uh, reputable, like it fixed major pain points, I think. Uh, it added things to the language and added something. Uh <laughs> that were supposed to fold in some of these old JavaScript 2 ideas that had come into ActionScript 3. So you look at the family tree and you see these forks and the main ones are the, the ones that go into Adobe Flash acquired from mm -hmm. Macromedia and the one that went into the server side of Microsoft's stack, which kind of died. Um, and then trying to bring them back into the standard and not quite succeeding, ES4 was, was mothballed. But all the good parts that everyone liked made it into ES6. And so that that was a success. And I, I said earlier, I had the wrong year. I think it's 2015, so it's off by. For ES6? We, we, yeah, it was done, finalized in 2015. It took a little longer than we hoped, but, because um, ES5 was 2009, and that was a smaller increment from ES3. We skipped four again, we mothballed it. Mm -hmm. And we had a split in the committee where some people said, you know, ES4 is too big, we're gonna work on incremental improvements no new syntax in particular, they, they promised. Not quite true, but uh, they, they, they added a bunch of interesting APIs, Alan Weir, Sprock, my company. So people still call it ES6, I call it ES6. Yeah. But if you remember, you know, off by nine plus 2000. Yeah, I mean, ES6 is such a big job. I mean, like you said, there's a thread that connects all of it, but ES6 is when it's like, became this language that is almost feels ready to take over the world completely <laughs> more programming in the large features more yeah. features you need for larger teams yep. and it software engineering microsoft did something smart too they uh anders and company um luke hoban who's left microsoft also did typescript and they realized uh something i think that Gilad brock has also popularized and and uh he was involved in dart at google if you don't worry about soundness in the type system. You don't try to enforce the type checks at runtime in particular. Just use it as sort of a warning system, a tool mm -hmm. time type system. You can still have a lot of value for developers, especially in large projects. Mm -hmm. So TypeScript has been a roaring success for Microsoft. W what do you think about type? Uh, what do you think about TypeScript? Is it uh, adding confusion or is it ultimately beneficial? I think it's beneficial. Now it's technically a superset of JavaScript. So of course I love it, right? Hey. The, the, the shortest uh, JavaScript uh, program is still a TypeScript program. Any yeah. JavaScript program is a TypeScript program, which is brilliant because then you can start incrementally adding type annotations, getting warnings, yes. learning how to use them. Uh, Microsoft's had to kind of look around corners at the standards body and guess how their version of modules or decorators should work. And, and the standards body then may change things a bit. So I think they're obligated with TypeScript either to carry their own version or to bring it back with incompatible changes toward the standard over time. And I think they've played generally fair there. There's some sentiment that why don't they standardize TypeScript? Well, they've been clear that... semantics around them because when you're talking about type annotations they're generally on you know parameters and return values and, and variable declarations they're cast operators you want that syntax to be reserved and you want it to 
work the same in all engines. And this is where ideas like Gilad's pluggable type systems might mm. might be good, though then you could create the same problem you have with Lisp and Scheme where there's a bunch of macro libraries and they don't agree and you, you, know, you have conflicts between them. But but pluggable type systems could, could be one way to standardize this. What do you think about the giant ecosystem of frameworks uh, in JavaScript? I, it feels like because I mean, this is a side effect of how many people use JavaScript. Yes, a lot of uh, entrepreneurial spirit, like yep. create their own JavaScript uh, j uh, frameworks. Yep, and they're all actually awesome uh, in our own different ways. And uh, that this is an interesting question about almost like philosophically about biological system and evolution, yes. all that yes. kind of stuff. Do you see that as good, or should it like? Should some of them die out quicker? I, I think that maybe they should. Now, jQuery was a very clever uh, thing. John Resig made this library that was sort of query and do and blended sort of CSS selector syntax with JavaScript sort of object graph or DOM yes. querying and made it very easy for people to do things almost like they were learning jQuery as its own language, yes. domain-specific language. And uh, that, I think, reflected in part the difficulty of using the document object model, these APIs that were originally designed in the 90s for Java as well as JavaScript. They were very object-oriented or even procedural. They were very kind of verbose. And it took like a constructor call and three different, you know, ho hokey pokey dances to do something. Whereas in jQuery, it's just one line, yep. right? So that fed back finally into the standards. It didn't, it didn't mean we standardized jQuery. It wasn't quite that concise, but... You find now with the modern standards that we were working on in the HTML5 sort of um, effort, that things became simpler. The fetch API and the query selector API, document.query selector. A lot of things can be done now in raw JavaScript that you would make mm -hmm. more concise and terse in jQuery, but it's it's not bad, it's, it's pretty good. Whereas in the old DOM of 15 years ago, it was just too verbose. So maybe the frameworks were born kind of uh, because JavaScript lacks some of the features of j jQuery. And so like uh, now that JavaScript is, is swallowing what jQuery was, then the frameworks will, only the ones that truly add value will stick around and the other ones will die out. And that highlights this also this division between the core language JavaScript, which can show up in other places like Node.js on the server side, and the browser specific APIs or the document object model APIs, which are even managed by the W3C, the standards body that was off in XML la la land when we were doing real JavaScript standards in ECMA. And you, you, you have this division of labor, division of responsibility and division of style and sort of uh, aesthetics and also speed. So the document object model really stagnated after um, Microsoft kind of de-invested in the web. And Microsoft did something in their haste, in the spirit of Netscape, doing things quickly and getting on first, mm -hmm. called DHTML. And some of their innovations that were like an alternative document object model didn't really get standardized until HTML5, when we pragmatists at Opera at the time, uh, Ian Hickson, who went to Google, uh, Apple and, and Mozilla said, let's, let's, XML is not gonna replace HTML. HTML4 is too old let's standardize HTML5 based on all this good stuff, including that DH. It's not often with web stuff, I, you have this f breath of just like, oh, whoever did this is, it, it, they fit, it, it just feels good. Uh, is that, what, what are your thoughts about HTML? Is the, am I being too romantic? A little uh, bit, a little it, bit. Are there flaws, <laughs> fundamental flaws to it that I'm just not aware of? <laughs> I'm, I, my, I'm, you know, my old friend Hixie did a great job. He was a, another uh, renegade physics student. Uh, he, and he was a basically a QA guy at Opera, but he obviously is a, a f trained physics, you know, uh, student and uh, someone who could write, a Britisher, he, he developed test suites and he started thinking about them more axiomatically. Now this is, this can be good because you can sort of systematize in a way that makes a better HTML, or you can get caught in the pragmatism of saying, well, we have to handle all these edge cases. So we're just gonna have sort of a, a test matrix. Mm -hmm. And if the matrix is large, it will not be beautiful by many people's lights. Everyone likes to minimize along their preferred dimensions, the seven special forms in scheme or whatever. But um, 
but reality is HTML needs uh, to be big. It's kind of shambolic, it's a creative multi-paradigm. And Hixie did a good job, I would say, with a, a bunch of it. Uh, other people came in in the spirit of Ian Hickson to, to do HTML5 work, and they've carried on that effort. And it's a so it's a mix of pragmatism, de facto standards from the past being sort of combined or written down for the first time, and then rethought in a way that has a simpler syntax, like the fetch API instead of XML HTTP request. Um, this video too, as well. It, it, it ultimately yeah. it feels like maybe you can correct me. It feels like it was the nail in the coffin of Flash. Steve Jobs saying no flash on the iPhone, in my opinion, was the actual, the, the actual stake through the heart. But, <laughs> yeah. but, well, I'm not, I'm not sure what trope you want to use. This flash was a zombie for until just this year, right, or last year. I think yeah. last year was the end of Flash in, in main browser. Animated all kinds of stuff inside Flash. Plus, there's a programming element. Yes, it was a little bit. I don't know if you comment on that, but to me, it was a little bit like go-to statement, like in a sense that it was a little bit too chaotic. Mm -hmm. Like it didn't, uh, that OCD part of me as a programmer wasn't satisfied by Flash. It feels like there was bugs that were introduced through the animation process that I couldn't debug easily. Yes, and I heard that too. I, I didn't use it, so I'm doing the grass is greener thing here. Yeah. The thing I, like, I liked about the animation model was that it was this immutable function of time. So you yes. could time warp and you could, if you dodged these bugs or worked carefully, you could really make it sing in ways that I think still a little challenging with the web uh, animation standards, but, uh, or just using raw canvas and WebGL. Um, but there's so many tools now that maybe it doesn't matter. And and yet we had to, you know, do video, we had to do uh, WebGL and then evolve it. Um, we had to do web audio. Um, but once we did all these things that helped Flash uh, die, thanks to Steve Jobs, <laughs> we had something that um, people didn't realize. We had that vision that Mark and Jason have this, this graphics capable, yeah. to the metal, uh, portable runtime. And we at Mozilla realized this, and we we saw JavaScript was something that you could compile to. Adobe had somebody in the Adobe Labs doing this too. He had a project called Alchemy. We had somebody who's now at Google, um, Alon Zakai, who did his own LLVM-based compiler that would take C or C++ and it would emit JavaScript. And you would think this is crazy. You're going from this sort of machine type, slow level, you know, controlled memory allocation language to this garbage collected, dynamically typed, uh, high level, higher level language. But alone, sort of just phenomenologically carved nature of the joint and found the forms that were fast in JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And then with Dave Herman, who I'd recruited from Northeastern University, who was a type theorist, and um, Luke Wagner, who's still at Mozilla, who was the compiler guy and, and the JIT guy, they figured out how to codify what Alon had done into a typed subset of JavaScript called ASM.js. And this is a strange thing to think about because it doesn't have new syntax. The types are casts that occur in dominator positions in the control flow graph. So it's it's like a hack on JavaScript and it's a subset. And it uses those bitwise operators that I talked about copying from Java mm -hmm. to basically cast um, num numeric types, which are double precision flowing point into integers. And so inside JavaScript, in the kernel semantics are integers. And if you use these operators, if a compiler emits them in the right places, you can then treat them as typed values, typed memory locations, and you can type check your program. And you can not only type check it, you can compile it. And this is all in sort of linear time, O N. You can, compile it to have deterministic performance. It doesn't touch the garbage collector. Mm -hmm. It calls a bunch of functions that come from the C functions or C++ code that you're compiling. And you can make the epic Unreal Engine go in 30 frames a second. Yeah. And when we did this in 2013 in the fall, you know, Tim Swift. <laughs> and uh, if you didn't have that fast compiler step, the JavaScript you'd write by hand trying to do an Unreal game would, would be too big and too slow. It would, it would touch the garbage collector. It would not keep up with 30 frames a second on the hardware, 2013 hardware. So we demoed that at, at um, 
Uh, this must have been fall 2012 now that I think about it, because we demoed it at, at GDC, Game Developer Conference 2013, mm -hmm. and people were stunned. It's like Unreal Engine, Unreal Tournament running in my browser window, no plugin, no Flash, no Java, no... So were those the early days of, because JavaScript now is able to run basically on par with a lot of the, the like C++. Yeah. And even before then, you had the fast JavaScript VMs in 2008 when Chrome came out. Just before it came out, Mozilla, my friend Andreas Gal and I, uh, and others hacked out TraceMonkey, our trace-based JIT. The uh, Squirrel Fish Extreme team at Apple did their JIT. And we were all competing on these, these crazy performance benchmarks. It was a little bit too much tuning of the benchmark. But JavaScript started getting fast, and developers started noticing it. But it was still kind of this its own high-level language with garbage collection. The ASM.js step helped us go further because until we really proved the, the concept, people were still saying, well, JavaScript's okay, it's getting faster thanks to V8. Everybody gave Google credit, especially Google. But, but we need something to kill Flash. Let's use the portable native client code that Google had acquired, native client, um, which is a separate lineage for taking basically C code, compiling it into a software fault isolated container of some sort using some kind of virtualization technique. And maybe it can even be in process and still be memory safe. That would be awesome. But they ended up using process isolation too. And that kind of weakened it. And in the end, it was like portable native client. Okay, you know, meet the new box. That loads into the same JavaScript VM that JavaScript loads into. So there'll be two source languages, one VM, very important, one garbage collector, one memory manager, one set of compiler stages. Uh, and that's called WebAssembly. And that's the successor to ASM.js. And it's important that it have binary syntax because at the end of the day, especially on mobile, if you're downloading JavaScript, even if you're using LZ compression on the wire, that's cool, but you've got to blow it out into memory and then parse the silly mm -hmm. eight character function keyword that I right. picked <laughs> when I should have used something shorter. I picked it because of awk, the Unix tool. Um, so anyway, I'm not following. I want to, but I'm not following the the awk thread. Yeah, but, don't worry. Uh, about it. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, is it surprising to you that uh, how damn fast JavaScript is these, these days? I mean, like, because you've been through the whole journey. Yeah. I know every every step of the way, but is it like? I mean, it's how it feels incredible. It does, but I knew. It, so the funny thing is, computer science is this big karmic wheel, right? Wheel of Fortuna, um, <laughs> and. Uh, in, in the uh, in 97, I was loaned by Netscape to do due diligence for Sun in their acquisition of <laughs> compiling VMs for them. And they, you know, well ahead of Java Hotspot or JavaScript V8 or any of these modern VMs, figured out how to make dynamic code fast. Because Smalltalk is dynamic language, right? It has classes, it has, uh, I think, more lockdown declarative syntax than JavaScript, but it's fundamentally dynamic. You don't declare it. Fails to the interpreter, and if it is right, you go pretty fast. And that short test is a predicted branch, so things are, things are pretty quick. All that amazing stuff I knew about in the 90s, and I, I, I didn't have time to do it, and Anamorphic got bought by Sun, and they did Hotspot, and you needed that even in Java because at scale, Java has some dynamic aspects due to invoke interface. You can have basically collections of Java code where the, you don't know at, at the time each each module or package is compiled exactly what's being called, what the, what subclass or what implementation of an interface is being called. Mm -hmm. And so you want to optimize using this sort of dynamic polymorphic caching there too. And they did that And Hotspot, it's amazing, amazing beast. I've met like 13 people who all claim they created it. <laughs> I think I think one of them maybe deserve credit more than others. Um, but uh, I didn't get to do that in JavaScript. And when we knew that that Google uh, was going to do their own browser, which we knew at Mozilla around 2006, um, I also met the team that did V8. And it turns out it was Lars Bach, who was one of the young engineers from Anamorphic, who got acquired by Sun. And so Lars is like the you know, one of the world's expert on these kinds of virtual machines. And he picked my brains about JavaScript. I could tell he didn't like it at the time, but <laughs> he had to do it. 
And oh, really interesting. Yeah, in 2006, lunch at Google's campus. Um, and and then I had another friend who was Deverell at Chrome, and he said, "Yeah, we don't know what they're doing. This is getting 2007 to fall, getting toward 2008." We're trying to get Chrome out, and we don't know what's going on with the V8 team. They're off in Aarhus, Denmark, you know, rewriting their engine four times, which is good. That's the right way to do this kind of development. You know, they were learning JavaScript, including all its quirks, which they came to hate, the fire of a thousand suns, which is one of the reasons that Lars and company did Dart, their own language. But they also made the language fast. And meanwhile, we knew this was happening, so we got our act together with... Um, Trace Monkey, our tracing JIT at Mozilla, and Apple, I think, was also aware, and so they were doing their own JIT. So the, the era of JITed fast JavaScript in 2008 had this prehistory going back to Smalltalk and Self and Anamorphic. And the again, the lineage is interesting because you had Lars at Anamorphic, and then he ends up at Google. Yeah, and today we have an incredibly fast language that, like you said, still, you know, without... <laughs> the good parts of the C operator hierarchy and, and just keeping things um, simple enough, maybe it could have been simpler, but I had, had to make it look like Java and interoperate with Java, that there was, uh, you know, inherent goodness, you know, Aristotelian <laughs> quality there. And people perceive that even through all the quirks and warts. And, and then over time, working on it with the standards body, working on it not only in as a core language, but in the context of HTML5 and making the browser better, uh, listening to developers, thinking about, this is something that Nick Thompson wrote nicely about on the Hacker News, I was very flattered. He said, Java was this thing where the experts were writing the code and it was compiled and you had to declare all your types and Sun didn't really give a damn about you know the average programmer who wanted to build real web apps, dynamic things. And I was in there, meanwhile, doing, uh, you know, a bunch of people's jobs making JavaScript survive those early years when it was kind of touch and go, right? JavaScript was considered a Mickey Mouse language. It was for annoyances like the scrolling text at the bottom of the browser in the status bar. Uh, but I, I kept listening to developers, working with them and trying to make the, it run in that single threaded event loop in a useful way. And I think that forged something that people have come to love. Now you don't always love, you know, the best thing, right? I, I talked about Shakespeare sonnet about um, uh, my mistress eyes are nothing like the sun or, you know, the scene from uh, Joss Whedon's film uh, Serenity at the end where the, the actual piece in the score by David Newman is called Love where uh, Captain Mal is teaching uh, River Tam about how to pilot a ship and she's a super genius, super soldier. She knows how to do it already. And he's he's basically talking about how you have to love the ship because if you don't, it's going to kill you. <laughs> and then the piece. The flaws, perhaps the flaws themselves are actual features, but that's a whole nother, that's a discussion about love. But underneath it, there's something that just connects with people. And it has to keep connecting. If JavaScript kind of went off in this, people sometimes complain about ES6. Oh, you put classes in JavaScript. I hate classes. You know, you right. ruined it. But it's it's not true. It's a dynamic language. Smalltalk had classes. Um, Python has classes. Um, there are lots of Lisp variants that had classy systems. Um, common Lisp. Um, so, you know, people who don't reject it based on some sort of fashion judgment do use it and do interact with the standards body. The standards body is competing browser vendors mainly, but also now big companies that use JavaScript heavily, the PayPal's and the um, other such companies, uh, Salesforce. And th they have to cater to web developers. They have to hire developers who know JavaScript. They have to keep um, their engines up to the latest standard. And this creates all this sort of social structure around JavaScript. That is unusual. I mean, you, you get C++ buffs that follow the inner workings of, you know, C++, mm -hmm. what is it now, 21 something, I, I don't know, I've lost track. But it's it's a more rarefied group, it's more like the old language, you know, yeah. um, gray hairs. Uh, whereas JavaScript is a younger and more, you know, vibrant, large crowd. There, there's a community feel to it. There, there's uh, echoes, that perhaps I don't want to draw too many uh, similarities. Maybe you can comment on it. There's a uh, C++ is like Wall Street, 
and the JavaScript is like Wall Street bets from the recent <laughs> events. It's like there's a chaotic community of all, and there's some power from that distributed crowd yep. of people that it's, ultimately it's more thematic. It's more of the people. Uh, it it lets people in without requiring these credentials. I remember in the late '90s into the '90s, people were all getting Java credentials, and I knew people. Um, and friends knew people who became Java programmers, and you knew they really should have been like nature guides or pilots. They hated programming, but they thought, I gotta yeah, make money, I'm gonna become a Java programmer. Do you have some, uh, because it's such a monumental moment in our current history, as a quick aside, do you have thoughts about this huge distributed crowdsourced financial happenings uh, with Wall Street bets? <laughs> yeah. That's like nobody could have, well, you could have predicted, but the scale and the impact of this kind of emergent behavior from independent parties that could happen. Like I said, my own um, experience with the dismal science, uh, as with <laughs> physics, led me to reject a lot of bad models. And, you know, economics was always compromised by politics, political economy. Um, you could also argue that it was, it used to be a branch of moral philosophy, so it was concerned with the good, and mm. it became divorced and became sort of in this quasi-Newtonian way, just about everything's just running by itself. Don't worry about it. You know, this and monopoly is crushing your Netscape company, but that's just nature. <laughs> and economics couldn't, or doesn't really have good models for the Wall Street bets subreddit. You know, they, they know how to uh, squeeze a short, right? It is, you could say it's monopoly, which antitrust wasn't enforced after yeah. US Microsoft for a long time. And, um, a lot of this was due to the money interests buying control of politicians. And, you know, in Plato's five regimes, that's oligarchy. Yeah. That's, that's, that's where we are. And now we're seeing a fight against the oligarchs. I don't know if it'll work, but you're definitely seeing it. And it's also kind of hackerish, right? It's got a hacker mm -hmm. ethos. You know, yeah. hey, Robinhood, no fees. Oh, interesting. Hey, you know, um, I can buy a fraction of a share in this thing, or yeah. I can keep buying with my stimulus check. So, uh, I mentioned Hegel seeing Napoleon on the horse. Right? <laughs> Hegel also talked about the the cunning of reason that you have the, the sort of you know God sees history in full, and if you believe in God, or you know we don't know the future, but there's always this sort of fly in the ointment, this uh, unintended consequence uh, that confounds the best um, plans of the the powers that be, mm. and we're living through it. That's I'm, I'm glad it's not you know street warfare or or mechanized warfare because it has been in the past. Um, uh, it's it's more mm -hmm. that are using your know, networks, machine learning, and so on on the browser. Is it possible in 10, 20, 30 years? that basically most of the world runs on JavaScript. This is a dystopia and a nightmare to some people. <laughs> um, when, when I when we did ASMJS and WebAssembly, I would joke and meme people with scenes like Neo waking up in his pod in the Matrix and he's all skinny and weak and hairless. Um, and you know, you realize in the future that you're living in some simulation that it's all running on JavaScript and you just scream forever. Um, it's possible. Gary Bernhardt uh, does these funny talks. He did Watt.js, and then he did this uh, Life and Death of JavaScript, I think it's called, where he he took some clever ideas that actually have a, a, a thread of uh, credibility to them. But I mentioned software fault isolation. It, in the old days when we were using computers, we we said, we're going to use the Unix you know, monolithic monitor, and it's the privileged program. This is before you even had hardware rings of protection. Those some of the early '60s operating systems used hardware protection zones, but Unix is privileged, and the program that runs user code in a process is is hosted. It, it's the guest in the host, and and you get to suspend it. You get to kill it. Uh, if it crashes, it doesn't take down the whole OS. It's a wonderful idea, um, but the call into the kernel is expensive, the system call, so-called. And this has even been optimized now for things like getting the time of day so it doesn't actually enter the kernel. Um, and meanwhile, 
hardware architectures and virtualization techniques have gone in a different direction, even to the point where you can do software fault isolation very cheaply without entering the operating system kernel. And so you get unikernels and exokernels and very lightweight VMs. And so Gary took this idea and said, JavaScript will take over computing because the system call boundary is too expensive. So everything ends up in JavaScript with these lighter weight yeah. isolation enforcement mechanisms. Yeah. <laughs> it's not totally beyond belief. Yeah. Um, it'd be WebAssembly too. It's nice to ask you sort of for advice to, uh, there's so many people that are interested in starting to learning about programming, getting into this world. Is there, um, some number of languages, three to five programming languages that you would recommend people learn, or maybe uh, a broader advice on how to get started in programming? Well, so you asked about machine learning, and you know, JavaScript is a general purpose language, and it's a, a language that's not, um, not that great for doing um, you know, matrix operations or um, doing parallel programming, I would say without using some extensions or some libraries that have some magic in them. So if someone wanted to, you know, learn, um, of the, it, there, there are amazing languages in sort of the APL family that are very useful for, I would say, linear algebra, which gets to a lot of the kernels and machine learning. And so APL had like J and then K, uh, and their K variants, because the guy that did K is still going and he's, they're proprietary, but he's still innovating there. Um, there are, you know, Python is used. So people talk about TensorFlow.js. Well, it's not that surprising because Python was heavily used for mm -hmm. uh, machine learning. And the, Python was always, you know, they didn't have this fast just-in-time compiler tradition. There were some projects that tried this and some of them were interesting. Um, PyPy was interesting, but um, it, the philosophy with Python was, oh, you need to go fast, write a C plugin. I mean, Drop into C code. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I one of our goals there, one of the reasons I sponsored it was we were all tired of seeing those remote code execution vulnerabilities mm -hmm. due to C and C++. Uh, and we thought, can we have a sort of safety property through a type and effect system or an ownership system? And Rust has that. And that ownership system is interesting because it doesn't just give you memory safety. There's a sort of theorem for free, a dual that falls out for protection against data races. So Rust is better for low level programming. You delimit your unsafe code where you do have to be unsafe uh, and you can prove certain facts about memory safety and race condition uh, avoidance. And so I think people should learn these new languages. I think Go is, is a great language. I admire, you know, the Unix, uh, People who did that, Ken still was involved, Rob Pike, of course, um, Dave, uh, what's his name, and other people. Um, Go is a huge success, um, really on the server side, anywhere you have um, you know, a lot of networking to do, and it's garbage collected, but it's also very pragmatic. It has that sort of C flavor. As an old C hacker, I can't get used to the fact that they swap the type and declarator. In, in the oh, declaration order. I haven't used Rust, but uh, this is one of the most respected and loved languages currently. So it's, it's yeah, an interesting and it's one. still young. You look at these things, JavaScript is now. Uh, should be out of the house, but um, it could be around another 25 years. Cannot rule it out. So Rust will be around for a long time. The longer you're around, the more likely you're Lindy and you're around. Your I mean, a, a lot of people ask me like, uh, I, I'm I'm often torn between recommending either Python or JavaScript as the first language mm -hmm. to play with because I mean it, it's difficult because it's so easy to do JavaScript incorrectly. It's much uh, it's much easier to do it correctly these days or like well like learn about programming. But the the cool thing about JavaScript is that you can create stuff that will put a smile on your face. Like as a, as a, as a developer, mm -hmm. you can create stuff and it'll visually look like something and it'll do stuff and it, it makes you feel good. It makes you fall in love with programming. With Python, you could do the same. It's a little slower and with C++, it takes five to 10 years to write a program yeah. that actually does something. Yeah. So like there's that tension between is JavaScript the right first step or is it Python? And uh, I've been going back and forth on those two. I have my Python, right? It came from, uh, 
a lineage of ABC, which was a pedagogical language in in the Netherlands, um, and um, it uh, you know um, it, it 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 was a, a good teaching language too. I think it is a good teaching language, and it's a little more restrictive in that if you misspell something in a way that JavaScript might let run let reach runtime, it'll get stopped at at uh, syntax check in Python, that's good for beginners. I think the the sloppiness that some people object to, like people were just tweeting at me, uh, having just learned JavaScript, they said, I can take a number and I can index into it and get undefined out of it as a property. And why is that? A number's not an object. And I explained why it is, because like in Java, the primitive types, which unfortunately are not objects, can be automatically boxed or wrapped by an object. And I made that implicit uh, in in Java, it's it's typed, and you have to declare things, and you'll get type errors. Um, but there are cases in Java where you get auto boxing or auto wrapping because you've declared that you want it. it. Um, in JavaScript, it just happens. <laughs> and so once I explained it, I'm like, oh wow, I get it. But it also means that you can commit a, a blunder that right. just you don't get punished for, you don't detect, and there's a, you get an undefined value, and you don't know where it came from. Yeah, right. I've been reading a lot about military history recently. Mm. And one way to paint the the picture of browsers, internet browsers, is through the various wars throughout its history. I don't know if that's a useful way to look at it, but we've already talked a little bit about Netscape and Internet Explorer uh, in the early days. Can you tell the story of the different wars, if that's at all an interesting way to look at it, of, of the 90s and to today? Yeah. So I mentioned that Microsoft, you know, which was convicted for it, <laughs> did abuse its monopoly, but they had a pretty good team by the time they did IE4. And Netscape, unfortunately, I was like the second floor and I was friends with all the first floor people, the front end guys who did the JavaScript event hookup and things like that. Um, that that team was fairly burnt out. And I think uh, having gone public, uh, the man upper management wanted to buy a bunch of companies to try to go head to head with Microsoft. Didn't work, but Buying a bunch of companies usually doesn't work. I think the modern s sort of approach it, it roughly is like Mark Zuckerberg uh, took, which is to keep them at arm's length and let them do their thing. Mm -hmm. And now that he's pulling WhatsApp in and people are fleeing it <laughs> because it's tied into the ad surveillance. But, um, you know, for a while there, keeping it separate really does work because you bought it for its value. It's complimentary and you're not messing with it. With... Netscape, when they bought a bunch of companies, they had some of the first floor people or the founders burned out. They had um, newcomers who wanted their turn to do the browser. And they hadn't really done browsers or understood them. And so Netscape 4 was originally supposed to be 3, and it was so late they renumbered it. We did a 3 release. Jamie and a few others put some extra effort into uh, Secure Mime was supported in the mail, uh, built-in mail program. Um, and Netscape 4 was late, and it was only on Windows at first, and Microsoft had really started doing better, like they do. They copy, and the first version is trash, and the second one, you're starting to feel a little threatened. The third one, you can tell what's going to happen, and the fourth one's good. And plus, there's the benefit, like you said, that it comes as a default browser. Yes. And, and yet, Netscape screwing it up, and Microsoft really putting some quality people on it, IE4 was good. On Windows, it was good. And they did the dynamic HTML innovations. The, uh, Scott Isaacs, my old buddy, a former accountant who programmed in BASIC and became what Microsoft calls a program manager, which is kind of an elevated position. It's um, You can be a programmer or an engineer track, but you switch to it and you sort of lead a lot of design and standards efforts. Mm -hmm. And so Scott Isaac put in a lot of those uh, funky DHTML APIs that didn't quite have the same flavor as the stuff that I did. And neither of them was like the later sort of verbose Java-like DOM W3C standardized. But i4 was pretty darn good. We I remember a friend, uh, Scott Furman and I, got invited by Scott Isaacs to uh, Gordon Biersch in San Jose. They were doing a preview of i4. This must have been 1997. And 
Scott said, yeah, we've got, here's the new graphics stuff we're doing. We've got something like your Netscape layers. Um, we've got you know, VML, a vector markup language. You know, we can do like virtual reality. And Scott and I looked at each other and said, we're doomed, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> Microsoft was starting to fire on all cylinders. So I have to give them credit for that, even though they abused their market power. And maybe, you know, I shouldn't give them credit for having the resources to hire talented people, but they did a, a credible job on IE4. What really was bad was, that phase of the browser wars ended with monopoly and right. perhaps due to the antitrust case, perhaps due to regulation in Europe, um, perhaps just due to Microsoft not liking dealing with standardization, they they let it rot. They just abandoned it, I5, 5.5, I6 later, but these were not well-maintained. They had a lot of security bugs. It browsers, feels really closed and outdated too, even had, though it's getting updated. It's it, just weird. Browsers like Mozilla and then Firefox were adding tabs. Opera had a version of tabs. And uh, they didn't add tabs. And they pop-up blocking, something I should have done from the start. People realized that you can tell when the user clicks something and it goes in JavaScript to open a little window mm -hmm. that you can sort of inspect the stack and see that the click originated that and it's probably okay. Whereas if you're just loading a script and it opens a new window, that's a spam technique and you yeah. should block it. Tabs were a brilliant yeah. innovation. Like you said, Opera had it, but like I remember I fully switched to Firefox the moment. It was, I, I remember like the moments of first using tabs in Firefox and like not liking it, like for the first few minutes. And then like, Wait a minute. <laughs> you get the groove, yeah. You get the groove the and you understand. Shortcuts, yeah. I mean, uh, so that timing, wh what year was this? Uh, so, because uh, also as a uh, aspiring web designer, I uh, use table. So mm -hmm. we, we didn't mention layout or CSS mm -hmm. much. There's also a change in the way, like the frames were going away. Yeah. Uh, so th there's a change in the way websites looked and behaved yes. and all that kind of stuff. CSS finally, which Microsoft embraced with IE4 and Netscape never really did right. Uh, CSS became a, a better standard over time for doing table layout that relieved you of the need to use what are called spacer GIFs. Yeah. Spacer GIFs, right? Spacer Images GIFs, yeah. you would throw into space out tables. Um, you know, the, the typographic power of the web has gotten better, but it's still not on the level of PDF and you can't do advanced typography, but um, it's gotten really better. And even then tables were getting better. If you were using Firefox, that would have been 2004 because it was called Firebird until early that year. Five, no, yeah, I think uh, it wasn't. 2003. Well, I, I don't remember, it was a Firebird, which had tabs. Uh, we had tabs the whole way. So yeah, it so started it's Firebird, out as yeah. Mozilla slash browser it became, in 2002, became Phoenix. There's a BIOS that has an embedded version of IE, and they said, we're called Phoenix Technologies, you can't use Phoenix. And so we said, okay, we'll call it Firebird. And then this Australian-centered open source database project started really, like, in the true Mad Max style, just screaming at us, saying, you can't use Firebird. And I, I had to sort of be the ambassador and say, okay, we're going to rename. And they're like, we don't believe you, you shouldn't have used it, we hate you. And yeah. then... We renamed it to Firefox, and they're like, "Ah, oh, we love you." <laughs> and then I don't haven't heard of them ever since. But <laughs> Firefox was a clever name. We had to think of something distinctive. We wanted to keep the fire going, and it turns out name. there's a red panda, right? Yeah. It's a nickname for. So. so that's the second set of browser second wars. browser wars. So what, how did you? How was uh, Firefox born? How's Mozilla born? Is there a sh there's a long story there too. So Netscape got acquired by AOL, which I, as I say, was a reasonable happy ending for a lot of people because Netscape otherwise was gonna go out of business because Microsoft was just killing its market. There was no way to charge for a browser. Windows came with IE, IE4 was pretty good and Netscape 4 wasn't that good. It took a while to get better. Um, but the Netscape executive said, let's do an open source escape pod, you know, and like in Star Wars A New Hope, the gunner won't shoot it because there's no life forms on board, right? <laughs> it's not a threat. Yeah. Uh, and so we did Mozilla in 1998, and it looked like it was going to, you know, initially just give the world an open source browser. But it's really hard to get people to work on this sort of hairball that had been hacked up over, by that point, four years. 
Uh, it also couldn't have the crypto module for secure sockets, so-called, or now transport layer security. That was an electronic munition. We were not allowed to release that in the full 1,024-bit key strength. Right. And um, yet people, one of whom I happened to meet previously at SGI when I went on a sales support engineering trip, uh, Tim Hudson in Brisbane, Australia, and um, Eric A. Young, did what became open SSL. It was called SSL EAY after Eric's initials. Mm -hmm. And Tim and Eric took their open SSL outside of the purview of the NSA and the Department of Commerce, and they stuck it into Mozilla's code. And that was perhaps the best hack that was done in the first few months after we open sourced the browser. We had other problems. The politics inside Netscape were riven by these acquisitions. So the one acquisition that kind of messed up Netscape 4, also wanted to keep doing it for pride. A mail program was just a browser. We uh, didn't know what AOL would do to us. Turns out they didn't interfere with us for a long time. But Netscape wasn't the best steward of Mozilla. We were operating Mozilla as a pirate ship without a legal entity. So most of us worked for Netscape under a separate organization and um, Initially, uh, the first engineering manager, Tom Paquin uh, of Netscape, was the Mozilla founding manager. Mm -hmm. But he he left pretty quickly, and he left me as the acting manager, <laughs> which is more like method acting in my case. <laughs> and um, and yeah. I I did that was my first management stint. But then um, someone who'd written the licenses, Mitchell Baker, she was a lawyer at Netscape. She was involved in the open source license. <laughs> And she said, I'll, I'll be the manager if you want. And, and Jamie and I said, sure. And then Jamie quit. He quit after a year. He said, this didn't work. I'm sorry. You know, it's, I'm, he, he acted like it was a total failure because Mozilla didn't restart the browser market. But there's no way it could have, right? Netscape was still sh shipping variants of Netscape 4, which was based on the old code. Mozilla was trying to re-architect the code to make green field for developers. So it was one of my big goals. It wasn't a technical goal so much as, again, a social goal. People wanted a more standard spaced browser. They wanted a, a less of a hairball that had been hacked on by ex-grad students starting four years prior. So we said, we're gonna make a modular code base. We're gonna use a variant or an open source version of Microsoft's component object model has reference counting and standardized v tables virtual calls and c plus plus and we're going to use uh javascript we're going to have a bridge between those two so you can script those components just like java components um and that was called zool xml user interface language and some real talent on the netscape side delivered that dave hyatt who uh, was instrumental in zool high school aged intern in that case. And at some point we were innovating rapidly in the Mozilla world and Netscape was still caught up in this management mess from these acquisitions and it wasn't delivering. And every year they were wondering if AOL was gonna come and start beheading the executive because it <laughs> didn't do anything yeah. useful. And there was this thought you should take the Netscape browser engine and put it in the Windows AOL client, which was the dial up client that all the increasingly aging users of AOL were using never happened and it would have been too, a bit too big a change. So it wasn't clear why AOL bought Netscape, but as I said, they left it alone, but Netscape didn't leave Mozilla alone. And so um, in 2001, uh, Mitchell called me up and said, I, I'm no longer employed. And I was like, what, you quit? And, oh no, this wasn't my choice. And there was a layoff, uh, which yeah. maybe accidentally or on purpose got rid of Mitchell. But the funny thing was we had an open source project. We had a lot of the engineers on staff on our side and we had, um, people we'd hired through the Mozilla community who were top notch. They'd risen, you know, they came in high quality, they knew the code and they actually were better than the average <laughs> or median hire of Netscape. And so the funny thing was the executive who thought they'd gotten rid of Mitchell in the layoff on the next week's community call around Mozilla and what to do, there's Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> and so this showed you can kind of transcend your, uh, you know, boundaries of corporate open source if you get a project that has enough loyalty, even among the paid staff, because we had outside people contributing. We had people at 
Red Hat and a few other places, but the majority of the hackers were employed by Netscape. But a lot of them at that point had had come from the community and others got the community and wanted to work with it. And it was really the weakest engineers at Netscape who didn't like Mozilla and didn't like the, the crucible of competing with the, the better uh, programmers. So if the project is good enough, it, it, it will rise, the Phoenix will rise out of the... That's exactly right. And so we had this this Mozilla code base that was getting better. In fact, it, I think at some point in 2002, when we declared Mozilla 1.0, we, I, I engineered a roadmap that successively through similar sort of six-week, five-week releases, like we all do with browser releases nowadays, Chrome does, and Firefox, um, Brave does three weeks. We, we, we got to a point where we said, you know what? It doesn't suck. This is like the 1.0 that you want to release because if you hold it back any longer to polish it, you're denying others the ability to use it. It's like Pro Engineer, the mechanical CAD tool, embedded mm. the code. They embedded the, the layout engine. Um, and Mozilla 1.0 was like a Netscape communication suite. We'd at that point gotten the mail people to reintegrate mail and news, and we had an editor for HTML. And it, it felt like a 90s suite, suiteware. Um, and it felt kind of bloated. And the people who were taking that Mozilla open source and then adding Netscape flavor to it were not calling the shots right. And they were also under ALL's thumb a little bit in that they said, well, we should probably put the AOL Instant Messenger chiclet on the toolbar. We should put the ICQ, you know, the other ICQ, messaging system yeah. that AOL had acquired, we should put the ICQ you know, button on the toolbar. And pretty soon, Netscape looked like a bit of a NASCAR <laughs> yeah. uh, badged version yeah. of Mozilla. And that also made Mozilla more popular. And and yet um, they they had, you know, contrived to um, fire or lay off the, the leader. And, and, and we'd carried on with an open source structure where Mozilla was still, you know, Mitchell was calling sort of management or uh, project level shots. And I was calling technical shots. And, um, we we had a popular suite, but we thought, why not make it just a browser? Because it'll be simpler, it'll do one job well. And even then we can strip it down by having extensions. So Dave Hyatt and Blake Ross, the high school aged intern, did the first version, which was called Mozilla slash browser. It was very, the group, small group of us, Ian Hicks and Asa Dotzler, me, uh, Joe Hewitt and Hyatt and, Blake and and they and Hyatt was really the senior hacker. He'd done all these things like amazing uh, cross-platform menus through the user interface markup language, um, and he knew how to do tab browsing. He'd implemented it natively on Mac OS of the time in Camino, um, originally called Chimera. He he'd written multiple implementations, which was. A thing programmers should do. It's like the V8 team did for those missing years when the rest of the Chrome team's like, "Where's V8?" Um, in fact, Dave's wife, uh, Rebecca, told me a story about when they were at UIUC, they were also University of Illinois uh, grad students. Um, there was an assignment, it was a programming assignment, it was supposed to be due at the end of the semester. And Dave's friend was this, I'm going to go think and I'm going to design and I'm going to make this you know, platonic perfect form of the program and then I'm going to yeah. write it at the end when it's due. And Hyatt just went in and started hacking and he wrote one version, he wrote a second version, a third version. End of the semester comes around. The friend's not doing too well. <laughs> Blake went to Stanford. He became a Stanford student and couldn't work on it. Um, Dave Hyatt went to Apple in 2001. He was one of the founding Safari team members. Um, interesting. Wow. But, but he was Red still blogging about tab browsing. I think Apple at some point said, you, Did you Safari shouldn't... have tab browsing? Yeah. But it was because of Hyatt. Yeah. Hyatt was quite a feather in their cap. The Don Melton, at, uh, who had been the engineering manager at, at, at for Safari from the beginning, uh, had been at Netscape also. And so there's this you know, diaspora of talent. And, and yet Hyatt was still kind of writing blog posts about how to do tabs right. And at some point Apple said, don't, don't blog about that. That's our proprietary tab technology. And it's like, no, it's not. It was an opera and I've yeah. refined it. Um, so we had to replace people and we had... Ben Goodger, uh, a New Zealander we hired at Netscape, and he stepped in to be the F Firefox lead. And we also had this weird circumstance where AOL finally did notice that Netscape was kind of a albatross, that they bought it for no particular benefit. And even then, the AOL politics were also heinous, sort of East Coast. <laughs> they were 
like what's what's Stillman's metropolitan film UHB um, urban haute bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie. Um, they were uh, haute, haute bourgeois they they were um, funny and they were kind of useless and kind of preppy and then the next year we went back and I said where's Reggie and it's like oh Reggie's not here anymore because Time Warner realized that the merger wasn't in their interest either and then the sort of knives came out and this was these these mergers rarely work right this is very difficult you get these giant companies and they think there's going to be synergy that was the 90s right. late 90s watchword and there wasn't synergy with AOL by Netscape and there wasn't synergy with Time Warner and AOL but did AOL ever really work was it ever really cool like the same kind of fire and excitement that uh, Firefox eventually created was that ever there in AOL the, AOL was the right time to do a dial-up service that got distribution by basically leaflet bombing compact discs right. on the country. And they beat out CompuServe and the other ones, Prodigy, and then the web happened. And so you had almost like this um, isolated continent, like mm -hmm. the, <laughs> some of the evolutionary biologists I follow <laughs> make fun of the, the the funny large mammal, you know, uh, marsupial mammals of, of Australia, how how silly they are. And so AOL is like Australia. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and the, you saw it over time because they kept aging and they were using AOL yeah. to get online and they couldn't really use a web browser. And it became sort of a, a, a valued cohort because they still have relatively high socioeconomic status and they have grandchildren, but it's going away, it's dying at some point. Towards the end of the aughts, the, that decade, and then to the decade uh, 2010 plus, that Firefox became this incredible, I, I forget when Chrome came out, but- 2008, I, September. 2008, but yeah. Firefox was the sexy, cool thing that represented a lot of the cutting edge technologies and all that kind of stuff. How web did it, 2, it, it was amazing. Tim O'Reilly and John Battelle did the first Web 2 conference, which eventually became huge and they split it. But that was in 2004, it was right when Firefox was out. Craigslist was was huge, it was killing classified revenue for newspapers, yeah. but um, there was just this ferment. People were starting- Wikipedia to, along there somewhere? Gmail was already done and it was an impressive web mail. There were others before it like Hotmail, but Gmail was really impressive from Google. And Google Maps, people started seeing mm. what could be done. They thought, how can you drag the map around and you know, how does that work? And it was all JavaScript and images and-, and um, so Gmail was 2003, four? So yeah, five. I think it actually started quite early. It might've been 2002 or three, but by the time we started dealing with Google and Firefox to get the search deal, which was the main revenue source for Mozilla and still is. Um, 2004, early, Sergey Brin's, uh, one of his trusted engineer guys, Fritz Schneider, made contact with me at Mozilla. And we started talking and we realized um, search and browser need each other. And this is deeply true, right? This is still true. This is why a lot of the search engines have their own browsers. Yeah, so in case people don't know, the, the main revenue source for the browser is the default search engine, which is kind of incredible to think about that that, uh, that, that is a revenue source. It's a little bit sad. Yeah, it leads to this capture or kill effect where you have the search engine own its own browser and other browsers may struggle to dis get this distribution we talked about earlier. Yeah. So where, and you said uh, you've, figured out that uh, Google is working on its own browser at some point. There. 2006, yeah. 2006, so would you say Firefox versus, was Internet Explorer part of the war here or was it Firefox <laughs> versus Chrome? So Firefox didn't quite cause Microsoft to reconvene IE. They did do IE7 and I remember being on a plane back from a standards meeting, JavaScript standards meeting from Seattle, from Redmond and there was some Microsoft guy in front of me, it turns out my, my wife knew him from her past life before we married. And he was just this bearded big guy. And he was like, we should have just killed Firefox in the cradle. All we needed <laughs> to do was add pop-up blocking in and tabs and we could have made it internet explorer right. kill Firefox. And it's like, shoulda, coulda, woulda, pal. And I was yeah. right behind him oh, yeah. hearing this. Um, <laughs> but they didn't, they were slow and they yeah. IE7 wasn't that great. And we really got... <laughs> For Chrome, and then Chrome, Larry Page said, what about WebKit? I said, yeah, it's nice. I have friends who work on it. You might use that if you do your own browser. Why don't you do your own browser? Don't worry about Firefox. You should do your own browser. You can have your own you know, opinion of how it should work. And and sure enough, they did. So by 2006, we knew they'd been working on it. Some of, the, some of my friends who'd been at Netscape 
did the original demo. And the demo wasn't what you thought. It didn't have the fast JavaScript yet that was still off in Denmark in the on a farm. Um, did it have tabs? It had tabs because all browsers had tabs at this point. And it had uh, this software fault isolation I mentioned. It was through process isolation. So in, in theory, each tab has its own operating system process. And so the, what's going to take your tab down? Well, WebKit has bugs that can crash it, but Flash was still big then, all the restaurant sites, remember? Mm -hmm. And Flash <laughs> crashed a lot. <laughs> so the demo that I heard about my friends, ex Netscape, ex a lot of people did inside Google was the sad tab. They showed an early version of Chrome, which is just this bare bones tab browser. They loaded a site with a known Flash vuln, and then suddenly Flash crashes, and everyone expected the whole browser to go down. Mm -hmm. But instead, you got this little sad face in the tab. And you could reload it, and there it is again. So this was this was uh, an improvement. It was a real move for security. It was based on, you know, a company they acquired called Green Border that had some really big brains, like Olfar Erlingson, I think, was involved, and they had done some exotic uh, security stuff. But they ended up simplifying it to this process isolation, and um, it was good. And Firefox didn't have it at the time, so we were still struggling with you know uh, security bugs. Um, so we knew Chrome was coming, but it took two more years to come out. And at the t we were still getting, you know, the Google search revenue and we were still, um, making Google the default engine and Firefox was still growing. Firefox grew, I think until 2011, that was when it peaked. Mm -hmm. And as it started falling, it was because of Chrome. Chrome came out in 2008 and it was, it had a comic book that leaked accidentally that showed some of the people who worked on it. Lars Bach was in there and so on. It was kind of soft launch because they didn't market it heavily. They didn't push distribution. Mm -hmm. But Google had reason to worry about distribution because Microsoft was, you know, doing a search engine, Bing, since 2007. In fact, when they came out with Bing, Google was worried that Microsoft would just brute force switch the default browser in everyone's Internet Explorer or, yes. or even Firefox yes. on Windows to Bing from Bing. Google. And uh, Microsoft wasn't, I think, ready to dare the antitrust cops that way, even though they'd gone to sleep. And uh, I don't think Bing was ready either. But in, just in case it happened, Sundar Pichai, who rose very well based on this work, was sort of uh, in charge of getting distribution deals. And he got Google Toolbar and Google Desktop Search distribution. And if you remember those pieces of software, those were like desktop uh, extensions, toolbars, or operating system extensions for doing desktop search, searching your local files, kind of like oh, that's right. Mac OS Spotlight, right? Sadly died out. It all first. died. And there were some features that we still missed that didn't make it into Chrome. Yeah. But Sundar got OEMs to bundle those. And then he got enough of those deals that by 2007 or eight, Google felt, well, if Bing, Microsoft does the worst and tries to force Bing, we can reach in and reset it with that point of presence. So that was you know, good for Sundar's career and it was good for Google, but it never came to pass that they had to yeah. defend. Microsoft was still, you know, slow. And by the time they saw Chrome come out, then they did what would have been IE9. And then they said, we're going to have a fast JavaScript engine to Chakra, Chakra Core. And uh, they did okay. They, they were another process isolated, fast JavaScript browser, tab browser. So it sounds like there's a deep, fundamental coupling of search engine and browser that's like mixing this whole thing up. And obviously Firefox doesn't have a, a search engine. Running Yahoo when Carol said, I've got to get rid of one of three expensive things. I'm going to get rid of search. And um, those researchers went to Google and Microsoft and there was no way to put Yahoo search back together. So when Firefox tried switching all their users who'd stuck with a default from Google to Yahoo, it was like mid-December 2014, a bunch of users said, what just happened to my Firefox? And others didn't notice right away, but over time they did. And so over the next year, the the traffic just went away for Yahoo. And and yet they were obliged, I understand it, I, I don't have inside knowledge, but this is leaked out and Danny Sullivan's written about it, Search Engine Land. I think the deal was like fixed payments to Mozilla. So Mozilla was getting a bunch of money for traffic that wasn't staying because users were resetting their default. And this shows how defaults are important, but they have to be good enough that the user doesn't override them. And 
you know, a lot of the commercial value in popular apps is what are the default settings? What is the default search? Yeah, um, but oftentimes there's something, just like you said, I mean, if there's something compelling, that's also can beat out the default, uh, like tab browsing and so on. Yes. And that's where, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about Brave browser. It feels like now we're in this third stage mm -hmm. where there's uh, Chrome, Firefox, Edge, I guess it's mm -hmm. called, and Brave. And these are, all seem like really exciting I don't know, innovative browsers. They're all kind of copying off of each other, picking up the good stuff. There's and evolution again, especially evolution. on tracking protection. So privacy is this sort of global um, wave that's rising. I like to call it a wave because it's a large, somewhat chaotic structure. It's not a unitary good. You can't say, I'm buying privacy for you know three dollars. I'm paying three dollars for privacy. Some people think a VPN does this and are disappointed when it fails them, but often people use VPNs for region unlocking video or getting the right. US Netflix Just, catalog. Yeah, exactly. Um, but privacy is is not a unitary good. It's complex and people are understanding it only over time and as they get burned. But there's a genie that's not going back in the bottle there. People are fed up. Apple has responded to this. Apple was always making Safari, I think, more of a privacy branded browser from the very beginning. I think this is probably Steve Jobs. Safari, you know, some site that you were embarrassed by or bought a gift for somebody you wanted to keep secret. Um, but there's still some level of tracking. There's network uh, tracking. There's Network privacy is not guaranteed at all because you're using the same internet and ISP as a public window, a non-private window. But Safari had that early on. They also had a, a cookie blocking policy that um, might take a little explaining. When you, if you know what a cookie is, it's a little bit of storage in the browser indexed by the name of the site. And it's really only the main name of the site, like B of A dot com or, um, you know, uh, something like uh, NPR dot org. Um, every site can store some information in a cookie every time it's contacted by the browser, the previous version is sent back, and in the response from the server, the cookie's updated. So it's this little bit of storage in the browser that the site can keep updating, and it can store an encrypted version of your login credentials with a timestamp so you can stay logged in without having to retype your password every time you navigate, which is how it would be if you didn't have cookies. Mm -hmm. The web protocols, uh, especially in the 90s, are so-called stateless protocols. So you go to your bank, you log in, you go from your login confirmed page to your account view. If you didn't have a cookie, you'd be logging in again. Yeah. Every, every time. time you type in the so, so that was the great thing about cookies. Lou Montoli did it in a hurry in 1994 before I joined Netscape, and he did it for really holding that kind of credential. Um, but even then, there was the image element embedded in the page, and the image gets fetched possibly from a different server, and that request carries the last cookie, which could be empty at first, and the response carries the updated cookie. So just by having images and cookies, you got tracking because that image server can be serving a little one by one pixel and they still use the word pixel in it. New York Times and ESPN. And as you go from one to the other, the image server can say, I haven't got a cookie for you. It's empty initially. I'm gonna assign you user number one, two, three, four. I'm gonna put a database entry in. And I see, by the way, I always fetch the name of the path part of the URL that I was in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. So you're a New York Times reader. Mm -hmm. And then you hit ESPN, same thing. And the database gets updated and the number, user one, two, three, four indexes in the database to a profile of you. You've been tracked. This was not intended. And it was too late to undo by the time I got to Netscape. Um, I think Lou wanted to do Twinkies, he called them. And he was trying to solve several problems. He wanted them to be bigger because initially cookies had a short size limit. And I think he wanted to solve the third party problem, but <laughs> Tom Paquin, the engineering manager said, nope, no Twinkies, just cookies. We're, we're done, <laughs> you're done, son. And um, that's how a lot of that stuff was. That's how JavaScript, you know, um, got frozen like a fly in amber in some ways with that sloppy equality operator that I made because yeah. of the early adopters. And the cookie got stuck with this tracking hazard. And then because JavaScripts can be like images, they're embedded in the page. By the time of Netscape 3, I made that work. Uh, 
you can get a request with the last cookie value and the response updates it. That's a tracking mechanism. And that's why you don't even need images to track. Now you just use scripts. Yeah. So this whole tracking uh, economy evolved and it, it, it depended on these accidents of the 90s, these unintended consequences. Well, it created some of the richest companies in the world, right? I mean, it's the social media. All I got was t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> All I got is this crappy t-shirt. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, so that's, that's the fundamental problem the world is facing now. They're looking at what social media has created and they're looking at, and like a world is looking at itself in the mirror and uh, seeing that privacy is actually something, as opposed to like a nice thing to have, it's something that is actually should be fundamental to the way we interact with the world as, mm -hmm. as part of our tooling. And that's where the Brave browser comes in. And I suppose others as well are playing with this idea, but Brave is at the forefront of that. So maybe can you like describe what Brave is yes. and what are its key principles? And uh, what's broken and what is it Brave trying to fix? So when I realized that these accidents, like the third-party cookie, the, the image or script that's tracking you, or the um, this JavaScript that can do it invisibly now, that all this stuff wasn't intended and that Firefox had supported extensions that block some of these things, I thought probably we should have browsers just block some of these things by default. These were not intended and they're now unsafe. They're tracking you. There could be data breaches, malware distribution, um, you know, uh, bullying and psyops and other mm -hmm. attacks on people. Um, block that stuff. Block that JavaScript. I've, I'm Dr. Frankenstein. I've got to <laughs> deal with a monster here. But obviously, you go to Gmail, there's a bunch of script there to make that amazing web client. That's okay, that's first party JavaScript. So how do you tell the first from the third party? And it's not easy. It's not a matter of just what's embedded from a different server because a lot of publishers use benign scripts from unrelated domains or apparently unrelated domains. So you end up having to develop a sort of human and machine learning practice around blocking. Mm -hmm. And at Brave, we did that from the start and built a research team to help drive it and automate it. We realized that protecting people needed machine learning. And around 2017 spring, I talked to my friends at Apple about this too, and they were also doing what they call intelligent tracking prevention, which uses local machine learning in the browser. And the funny thing is, we, you know, great, great minds think alike, we were, they were taking their third-party cookie blocker that was in Safari from the old days and making it not have a big loophole. Because what they did was in 2003, when Safari came out, they said, we're going to block cookies that are from those third-party embedded elements where you've never visited that site before. So I'm gonna pick an ad, an ad company that got sold to AT&T, so I'm not picking on anybody unfairly, appnexus.com. Have you ever been to appnexus.com? No. Nope. I've never been there, but I guarantee you 10 years ago, you probably had, if you were using Firefox, you had a cookie, third-party cookie, because you were being tracked by them. Hmm. And they were using that cookie to build up a profile of you. In Safari, as long as the user never went to AppNexus, that cookie would not be set. And that was a real move for privacy early on uh, when Jobs was still around in Safari. But it had this loophole that if you do go to AppNexus, then why it's okay to be a third-party cookie. And mm -hmm. so AppNexus did something very naughty. They, they took their ad partners that put the actual ad you click on, and they said, hey, add a little script so that when somebody clicks on the ad, before it goes to your landing page, redirect to AppNexus and we'll redirect to the landing page. And by doing that, they set a first party cookie and they got whitelisted. Mm -hmm. So it was a loophole they exploited. Intelligent tracking prevention in Safari was sophisticated enough to, to counteract this and it did other things and it's evolved since they did it. And we've evolved Brave too. And so I, when I say machine and human learning, there's a real um, set of techniques here. They have to fight- This is think, a fascinating problem actually. Fingerprinting, right? Anytime yeah. you have a little bit of storage in the browser associated with a website, if the bad guy can get 32 websites, each one has a bit of storage, that's 32 bits. You can turn the bit on or off. You can make 4 billion numbers. You can make an identifier. It's called a super cookie sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a f there, are, there are weaker ways that are statistical. They're called fingerprinting. You have to block all of them and you have to not only automate, you, you want to work in the web standards body to put privacy in 
by default, by design, from the get-go, not added as an afterthought or, you know, go hog wild with new web APIs that add a bunch more local storage or fingerprint surface area. And that's been a struggle too, because guess who's the new Microsoft in the standards body? It's Google. Mm -hmm. And they're not in favor of privacy first. They, they want to do privacy their way, only under, I would say, market pressure. But with Apple uh, and with Brave leading the way, we, we block third-party cookies almost without exception. So we just block them. And that gives us a very strong privacy uh, benefit. But it also means some sites just don't work right. Embedded YouTube videos might not work right. So we're adapting in a similar way to Apple's done with ITP to make uh, third-party cookies blocked, but to sort of simulate what looks like a working third-party cookie for the site. It mm -hmm. essentially tries to I, partition each site and its third parties into its own sort of cookie uh, jar. Got it. And yeah. so, and like like you said, is, is this both like a human uh, fine-tuning issue and, and the machine learning yes. problem? So and as, you, as the humans learn, then they train the machine learning. But, you know, uh, maybe Google side or including Google, there's millions of dollars, if not B, billions of yes. dollars to be made from fighting the ways of Brave. That's right. And it's been uh, an interesting change from when we started in 2015. When we started, you know, ad blocking extensions, Adblock Plus was one of the big ones that started in Firefox in 2006, I believe, had gotten to a certain level of use around the world. And browsers like UC Web, UC Browser in Asia, had some amount of ad blocking built in and on by default. So a page fair was a startup uh, and they measured ad blocking adoption and they tried to say, hey, publishers, you're, you know, 30% of the visitors to uh, Pitchfork or Wired to Condé Nast properties are using ad blockers. If we can somehow convince them to lower their ad blocking for your site, that could be like a 43% lift, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, three sevenths. Well, that's easier said than done. And PageFair and others, SourcePoint, many others, tried to either smuggle ads through or cajole the user into uh, letting you know ads appear. And it didn't really work. And meanwhile, the <laughs> sort of pulled on the Google's plantation through AMP, AMP, mm -hmm. or, you know, we're, we're getting killed by the Google ad system we use because it's taking all the revenue mm -hmm. or, you know, it's permitting, or some other vendors we use are permitting ad fraud. And so a fake New York Times is getting paid by the marketer running an ad that a, a, a bot clicks on and the real New York Times that's supposed to get that ad doesn't get it. Um, and there's and, something really broken about that kind of system. And that, yeah. that fraud is mediated through Google's ad exchange, which is the biggest right. of them all. And Google takes a fee. There's a flip side of that, which is malware distribution, malvertising, where fake advertisers put malware payloads in, or lo exploit kit loaders in JavaScript, and they smuggle them in ads onto real publisher pages. The ad exchange takes the fee. Now, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not gonna say this is a RICO predicate, but why is the ad exchange facilitating fraud and malware distribution and yeah. taking a fee? It's not right. As opposed to just fighting, this is the really interesting thing about Brave is as opposed to just fighting and then being treated like an ad blocker, you're providing an alternate, there's a, there's a philosophical idea here that might change the nature of the internet yes. with the basic attention token. Yes. BT, well, maybe what is, basic attention token BAT and how does it work? Okay, I'll tell the story first by saying how I came to it. I realized <laughs> for a long time at Firefox, we were dependent on this Google search deal. And I thought, you know, w now that Chrome's out, maybe that's gonna go away. And they just, well, at some point, Google will say, you know, Firefox, you know, like old yeller, you saved me from the rabid beast. Now I have to shoot you in the head. Yeah, Done your job, sad but true, goodbye. And what could we do? And I think the sort of passive servant of these big tech companies, why is it a blind runtime for ad tech JavaScripts, including from Google? Why doesn't it block some? And if it blocks some, why can't it reconnect users, readers, fans with publishers, creators, websites, uh, why can't it help people make direct payments or even possibly get 
an ad revenue share for private ads that are placed in the browser. The ads are all placed in the browser. Some people have this sort of model that the server is painting the ad into some, mm -hmm. you know, flash uh, uh, <laughs> c combined package or into some giant image, and then it all gets sent out. And that's not how it works. All the ads you see on the web are placed in your browser by it calling out to various ad tech partners, mm -hmm. and Google's among them. And 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 so if you block those scripts, you you break the the advertising flow of money from the brands and their agencies to the publishers. And if you want to reconnect it directly with the user, you have limited choices. The user generally isn't going to sign up with a ACH bank connection or a credit card. Mm -hmm. The the publisher isn't going to sign up the user except as a subscriber, and then they're going to overcharge you because they want you to cross-subsidize all the content and buy more than you read and all that stuff. And how many you know, people are doing great who are big names like New York Times and the Washington Post, but how many subscriptions are you as a user going to pay for? This is why startups like Tony Hale's Scroll are trying to do a portable subscription mm -hmm. system. But by the way, just on a small tangent there, even the New York Times is really annoying how difficult it is to, to subscribe. Yeah. There's way too many clicks. They don't make it easy. And I had friends a few years ago, I think they fixed this, who would pay for the paper and then they'd go online and they get upcharge for the digital and they there was no break there was no connection between them yeah um but publishers are not that technical and they're they can't all get you to subscribe you can't have a thousand subscriptions so for a long time people talked about micro payments there was blendle and the other ones which came to the u.s but didn't grow and i thought if you have just a browser and it's protecting you by blocking all this ad tech tracking junk it can provide you an option that uses cryptocurrency to let you support your your, your favorite sites and even YouTube channels. And that we prototyped with Bitcoin. And that meant the user had to be of means to contribute and willing to contribute, mm -hmm. but it could be done on the Bitcoin blockchain. Month, but the fee is like 450. I better buy in larger batches, right? Then right. they're like, oh, I don't wanna own that much Bitcoin. So it became this, this painful thing. And the real idea that I had of, private ads that pay the user a rev share couldn't be realized alone in, in that kind of system. In these cryptocurrency systems, especially with the blockchain we switched to, Ethereum, you can have smart contracts. The Bitcoin system is not Turing complete, so what you can do with the script is more limited. But you can still do sort of clever things, um, even with Bitcoin script. What we wanted to do was sort of a, a three-sided ecosystem. We wanted users creators or publishers and advertisers. And we wanted the advertisers to put money in just like they do today, but without going through the Googles and the app nexuses and all these other ad tech companies, because those companies take out a huge cut. The Guardian in the UK once did an experiment for a month. They bought out their own ad space. They put in a pound and they were paid 30 pence. 70% oh, yeah. was coming out wow. to the intermediary vendors they were using. Wow. Um, and that's like the opposite of what the App Store does. The App Store takes 30% and gives the publisher 70%. So pretty broken. In the old days of the Superstation TBS, the media um, owner would get 85%. So these splits have become really unbalanced and the middle players the the ad tech vendors are taking out way too much money mm -hmm. and they're they're doing something worse which has been noticed they're they're letting um not just the malware vendors but also the ad fraud side which fakes the publishers and clickbait merchants uh come in and, and steal traffic from good sites mm -hmm. because once you have a certain audience identified at one site jason calconis told me this about his experience with I guess it was in Gadget. Uh, I forget what he, which site he was running, but. Unfortunately for us and for all of blockchain, the regulators are saying, we're gonna have to know who you are. There's, there's the, the Treasury Department's uh, FinCEN mm -hmm. uh, agency. There's the Office of Foreign Asset Controls, OFAC. Uh, there's the, um, you know, other regulators in the federal government that take a very dark look at things like money laundering and sending money to someone named Osama bin Laden. So compliance starts to come in. And even now they're threatening for pure Bitcoin, sending to some address. If you're a, a Coinbase, you're going to have to know who, who's at that address. You're gonna like start... the actual identities of people involved. Yeah. 
Now, with Coinbase members, you sign up and they know you and they comply with the regulations. They're a regulated money services business. Uh, and um, But if somebody's using their own self-custody, so-called self-custodial wallet where they have the hardware private key and they're not named and they want to send to that address, <laughs> our friends in the federal government are talking about requiring at some threshold knowing who that is. So some threshold that's unreasonable. Like, uh, it's not that big. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how this will play out. I, I think crypto is here to stay. I think the beauty of being able to send peer to peer without any bank in the middle, without any, you know, huge wire charge and two day delay and all that nonsense is beautiful. And I've used it and I love it. But we're pragmatists and brave about crypto. And we realize that anything like a revenue split, we can't facilitate without being licensed in a certain way. And it requires knowing who the user is. So our default mode doesn't know who the user is. It instead imputes to the user's browser some of the revenue and allows that browser to steer it back mm. to the creators. And we do have to identify the creators. But as things improve, and you know, who knows how it'll play out, there, there should be come a day when this this full vision can be done more uh, fully on a blockchain. But regulations and the practicalities of today's blockchains, which are not that fast uh, and not anonymous over time, you fingerprint yourself over time, uh, we do some of this with the browser. So one of the ideas with the basic attention token is to make a hybrid system that's stronger than blockchain alone. It's the browser and the blockchain. And the browser is this trusted endpoint software. It's this universal app. Everyone uses browsers. The bigger the screen, the more you're in the browser and the less you install, you know, fat clients for things. Um, I use Slack on, on Mac OS and it's, it's like a browser. It's based on an Electron framework we used to use. And it's just, it's not that great. I, I some of the people at Brave use Slack in Brave as a- In the browser, in yeah. The browser, yeah. I use that often, yeah. And I noticed on the iPad, I use apps less. Um, the smaller the screen, you know, the browser got handicapped by Apple and Android both. And it also, uh, you know, can be slower or not have the right, you know, affordances, the user interface or the, the security uh, limited APIs. But in principle, with the right permissioning, you can make the web browser just as good as any app. You make it be a super app. And that's part of our mission at Brave. So we want to have the economics that got captured by these big tech companies through mm -hmm. tracking and through social networks. We want to block that for your own safety and then let you opt into a cleaner world mm -hmm. where you keep your data defended in your browser and you can actually realize value from it. So the way our ad system works, I mentioned it being private, but how does that work? We don't see your data at all. All browsers are sort of the mother of all data feeds, your history, all your searches at all engines, each engine sees the queries you send to it, but it doesn't see the others, but the browser sees them all. Machine learning in the browser that you can opt into can study all that in a very complete way and awesome. do a better job than Google does. Google has, you know, cookie and scripts across the web from acquiring DoubleClick, they have YouTube, they have Android, they have search, which is still their big revenue layer. Mm -hmm but they don't see everything. The browser sees everything. And if it can do a good job locally, and this is not advanced machine learning, this is not TensorFlow, this is like SVMs now, mm -hmm. Naive Bayes, um, then you can match intense signals, intense signals from those data feeds, the searches, the queries, the history, how much you're scrolling down a page, uh, how much you... <laughs> And so we're, we're making an anonymous audience available to advertisers without the advertisers tracking them. Instead, each browser is, wow. a, is a little machine learning system that's picking the best catalog entry. Now the catalog is not the ads, those are big, right? It's a video or a web page. It's just the link to an edge cache. And there are many such edge caches. We're not trying to protect them from seeing your IP address. It's not really feasible. We could use Tor, but we don't yet. Um, and some keywords about the ad. So it's basically like, metadata and a link mm -hmm. and that's what the catalog consists of and that's what the machine learning picks and the machine learning is learning about the you specifically locally yes. in order to choose from the catalog of different ads ability to give the best deal to users so 70 percent of the gross ad revenue we give to the user and if they to go through that KYC process I mentioned, they can take it out. They can also give it back, they could take some out, give the rest back. They can add 
basic attention tokens to give back. Some of them turn off the ads because you just don't like ads, but they put in $20 a month. Mm -hmm. So I believe Zuko of Zcash Frame does that. And that's very generous because the browser is just anonymously based on his browsing, sort of keeping score on how much time he spent on this video, on that website. And if those sites verify in sort of a, like getting a domain certificate fashion, they can get paid. They can get uh, part of his $20 a month. So that vision could go big. And if it does, I hope it's across multiple browsers. I don't know that uh, they'll all compete well on the quality of the ads, the quality of the ad blocking and tracking protection. Those those are subject to competition. It'll take a while to standardize them. But I, th I think that would be a better world. It would have less counterparty risk, fewer t fee takers in the middle, really just the browser. We're taking 30%. Um, the, sort of the app store, app store split. And if we get bigger, maybe we can take even less. Social networks, creators. If you look at YouTubers, a lot of them, of the indies that are getting some size are getting... What if Brave pioneered at first and we took 3% mm -hmm. and we did it in a way that was through your browser so we couldn't censor it? Um, yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. Do you think it could be standardized across browsers? Can like uh, Internet Explorer come in again and, and uh... <laughs> they, yeah, <laughs> protocols are easy to copy and that they're meant to be interoperable. So it's there's a risk there, and and the loyal users might be tricked into leaving you, or they might because of that distribution. Power. I'm hopeful that we'll have a period of innovation. Uh, you know, people were talking like Elizabeth Warren was talking about breaking up the tech tech companies very clearly. Um, now she didn't win, and I suspect that won't happen, but I also suspect that Google might be smart enough to see they should do something more than just put privacy perfume on Chrome. They should maybe get rid of double click or something, divest something. I don't know, it might happen. So so Brave might inspire Google to completely change the way they're doing things in the They're browser. already doing something you, you may have read about called the privacy sandbox or, um, flock which they have this bird metaphor going um turtle dove um fledge but these 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 systems have been very googly kind of over engineered and yet depending on differential privacy which has weakness over time if you know how that works it's kind of injecting noise to hide you in a, in a crowd but mm -hmm. over time an adversary can pull you out of the crowd Th this doesn't look like it's going to become a standard like apple Brave, Mozilla, we're not gonna just say, oh, Google, you saved us. You've invented the privacy sandbox, so we'll all just adopt it. Not gonna be that easy. It's gonna be more like pieces of what we do in Brave, the synonymous ad matching or the blind signature cryptography we use to confirm the ad impressions. That's David Chalm's invention. That could get standardized. And in fact, some of that is being standardized. Even Google's in favor of so-called trust tokens, which are Chalmian blind, blind signature certs. But they're not using them for ad confirmations because they don't want to blow up their own business. Um, and they need to let some of the publishers they serve have other ad tech scripts on the page. And so they're kind of caught. And this is something I realized doing Brave. I thought, what's you know Google's innovator's dilemma apart from just you know get, being mature and having trouble innovating? It's that they have come to depend on this ad tech system that has all these, these vendors that are publishers rely on because publishers aren't technical enough. And I, I feel for the publishers, but I realize the users have to come first. And if you give the users a better browser that's faster, then you'll get enough users to, to give back or support publishers. The speed and the battery savings and the data plan savings are significant. There's so much bad JavaScript involved in ad tech that if you block it, mm. you sort of chop off the what's called the programmatic waterfall, which chains a bunch of requests. Yeah, that's one of the incredible things about Brave. I guess you're saying you should attribute it to the fact that the the, the messy JavaScript. No offense. No, it's, uh, right. it's <laughs> not my <laughs> like, uh Is uh, I mean, Brave just feels faster, even than I mean. Chrome was fast. One of the things that it was like impressive is it in, it uh, showed that browsers could be really fast, and Brave is even faster than that, which is incredible. Block so much, and it saves the network. It sa which means data plan. It saves battery because the radio consumes your battery when it's running more to do those requests. And it's just stunning how many there are. Like uh, some of my Google friends were like, "Oh, that's just that bad site. They'll fix it." And you actually yeah. do a survey of web pages that's not like mostly like that. <laughs> I know Google Google engineers could make everything super efficient, but they can't 
especially in antitrust court, do it. They cannot take a What about social networks? Well, they're inherently, like search, a global algorithm. You, you're trying to find friends of friends. You're doing the transitive closure of a graph induced by this friend of relation. But you should own your friend relation. You should own your posts. They shouldn't be owned by somebody else who can take them down or censor them. And your friend relations, you should be able to find those friends on other networks. And so I've tweeted about this. I haven't built it yet. What if the browser could keep track of those for you? What if the browser could maybe combine Facebook and Twitter and you could find your friends on both and you could have a sort so of So that multi relationship is not owned by Facebook or Twitter. It's owned by you they, they through love, the browser. They'll have terms of use and they'll say they own it. But if they zap you on one and you're still on the other, your friends find you and the browser could preserve a combined view. You could resurrect almost right. across networks. It's something I want to maybe quickly ask you about. On that front, there's been a, quite a lot of um, centralized, we, we talked about Wall Street Bets and yep. then uh, uh, Robin Hood. Yep. There's been centralized banning of uh, different accounts mm -hmm. and removing like Parler, for example, from AWS yep. and this kind of overreach of centralized control. Is your hope that it's possible to, like what are your thoughts about that in general? Is it, and then is it possible to create tools that give individual people the power to fight back against overreach of such control. So we're talking about oligarchy, I do think, and that if it controls a nation state, that's formidable. It's the tax and the police power, the military power. It means that you may have the great firewall of China. <laughs> by terrible, terrible people, right? Yes. I don't care if you, called them neo-Nazis, some of them could be doing illegal things. Right. And um, you don't want them colonizing because it'll ruin your reputation and destroy your business. So what you really want is that kind of user-first subsidiarity, that subjectivity. I want my social networks to be composited in some multi-social user interface where I don't lose track of people across networks. And if they leave one or they get banned from one, I can find them on another. I can still sort of thread them together. Yeah, that's brilliant. And, and, and this didn't happen because browsers got captured by the central powers. Right. Why did they get captured? Mostly because of search. And search is a central algorithm. So, you know, Larry Page said this too many years ago. He said, with search, you're giving up a little privacy by handing the query over to us. Mm. And you know, we'll error correct it. Alan Eustace used to be a Google and Google executive. He said, oh yeah, we used to laugh. They'd all be doing typos and they'd be typing the wrong word. And we're like, no, dummy, type that query. And it's like, okay, Google, you might want to dial back that ego a little bit. But yeah. yes, you do see all the queries and you can improve them and you can find the best results. And that was Google's forte. When we did the Firefox deal in 2004, Google was really good. Mm -hmm. And over time, you know, SEO, which is an adversarial game. Yeah. And Google itself buying all these companies and crowding its own results page with its own tied in yep. stuff. The YouTube It's, it's a slippery slope that happens when you when uh, when you have control over these kinds of really important mechanisms it's, at the center yeah, of the internet. Monopoly capitalism or cartel cap you, you get this with the Robin Hoods and the the hedge funds. You get uh, uh, sort of the money interests take over and kind of abuse their power and wear out their welcome. So what how do you get around that? You have to have uh, um, either new land to go to, which you know some people's ancestors, not mine, <laughs> did to found the country. Um, um, I'm mostly Irish German. Um, <laughs> you, you have uh, new virtual space people go to, and that requires you know an ISP to or a colo center or Amazon to host you. It requires domain name registrar who will not strike you, and so you know, when Parler was taken down, you know. I thought that was egregious. Parlor, I, I, it was not well designed, and I, I tried it out because I tried all these things. Yeah. Um, but I didn't use it, and I, I also felt they were being unfairly scored for not moderating because you can find tweets to this day that yeah. are horrendous well, and threaten all sorts of violence. Whereas Twitter, why isn't Twitter being taken down? But so it was very selective. It was the insiders who have the power. This is the Lex Free Podcast.